Okay, let's now head into part three of this marathon uh, lecture on um, neurology and probabilistic thinking for the emergency physician. Um, what I want to do with this part three is I want to begin with a more overreaching and again quite fuzzy uh, introduction topic. Uh, and if you don't want to listen to that, then you can just skip it and go right to the cases. I'll mark it down in the um, in the YouTube clip where you can skip to the cases. Um, but for those of you who are interested in this stuff and the thinking behind it and some of my um, blogs uh, that I've written on it on this, um, then I'll try to explain these um, quite complex um, topics in the next. Um, in the next uh, bit here. So this is the um, disposition for what I wanted to go through before heading into the real cases. Um, first of all, I want to talk a bit about learning uh, and learning from case-based case -based learning. Um, and second of all, I want to talk about leadership, psychological safety, and how we can establish, establish this learn not blame culture. These two topics are very interconnected and they are very interconnected with everything I've, I've talked about so far. It's kind of the metacognition behind this behind the scenes kind of um, what I've been talking about so far. Um, and I just wanted to go through this before we head into the cases. Um, I've written some of my ideas on this, um, and again, this is not my ideas. These are ideas I've picked up and and practiced through different um, circumstances, and I'm greatly uh, grateful about uh, having been able to do that. And please comment if you have any uh, comments on what I'm about to say. Um, but this is how I synthesize all of this. Uh, data um, and my experience on this um, particular topic. So, first of all, learning in general. There are some um, topics that I just wanted to touch on here and give you some links for where you can learn more about this. Uh, first of all, it's often said that um, practice uh, makes perfect. But in the FOMED community, it's been a golden rule that we say um, perfect practice makes perfect. You need that kind of you need that reflection in your practice, and you need that kind of feedback uh, in your practice. And um, this is extremely important. So you uh, and the, the, like the essence is you can't just go to work every day and suspect, uh, expect that you get better. You might do that in the beginning. But after a while, you will plane out and you need some kind of um, often feedback to cover your blind spots in, uh, to be able to grow or at least some kind of reflection on your uh, on a specific part of your work. Um, much more can be read about this in some of these um, some of these links over here to the right. Um, also, um, uh, E.M. Crit and Anders Ericsson, uh, who wrote the book Peak, has written a lot about this. Then there's the six um, evidence-based areas of how we learn. And I'll just uh, go through quickly about uh, these. Um, there's interleaving, meaning that, well, you take one topic and then you... Um, um, then you begin on a, another topic and then you go back to the first topic so that you don't don't do one topic um, all at once but you will um, jump from topic to topic uh, so that um, so that you 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 don't just um, do one topic um, at, at, at and, and learn everything there is to to know about just that one um, then there's the examples you need to do. It's really good to, to do examples of what you're talking about because that will um, not only uh, give give yourself or your learner a um, a more um, a more concrete example of something that might be quite abstract, but also it usually leads into the next one, which is elaboration. If you 
can give an example and you can you often use a question such as what if this happen and happens and or what if that happened what if this patient actually did have a blood pressure that was um, high um, what would we do then or what if this patient was a male or an or an et, uh, ethnic Asian should we think something differently like you can do this what if question and you can um, and that usually leads you into elaboration uh, in your examples and that will make you think critically about your decisions um, and make you learn even more then there's re retrieval practice and i mean after after you've done this entire lecture um in in more than one sitting i hope uh, then it would be good to like in a, a couple of days sit down try to remember the structure of the nervous system as i as like the basic model i i, I with with their brain med medulla and the peripheral nerves and the muscles try to try to sit down and write it down um sketch it out and and then 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 try to draw the the stick figures or the uh, uh, the mannequins with the with the um, location based um, uh, focal neurological deficits see if you uh, and that that's kind of the retrieval practice that you you don't have your primary source at hand you will try to do it just from memory and you'll try to do it on a piece of paper or you might uh, i i enjoy doing it uh, in different variations so i enjoy talking to people about it or trying to tell people about it or or talk to myself when i'm out walking trying to retrieve some of the information trying to explain my own words and i find that the more the the, the more vari variation you get in your um in your way of it retrieving like both sketching it out or doing tables or talking about it or um, doing presentations on it the more ways you, you like can get at a topic the the, the higher you will get in what um, you uh, you you often call Miller's pyramid that you to begin with you kind of you kind of know what it is and you kind of know what the concepts are and then you uh, as you go up you um, can explain it and in the end you can actually do it and you can perform it and you can actually teach it so 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 that, that there's a hierarchy that can be established by uh, for instance retrieval practice then there's then there's the the thing that everybody knows about the spaced repetition that we um as we as time goes by you will forget what i'm saying now um and it's quite uh, this, is, this happens quite fast and therefore in the beginning it's more important to have frequent repetitions and as it's as the knowledge is manifested like knowledge that you knew for uh, in med school you and has uh, have, have like um been been um practicing for a long time might not take as much retrieval uh like space repetition to actually re like to 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 be able to present again so so but if, if you're learning a new topic then you, you will need more space like more frequent uh, repetitions in the beginning and this like moves out um and, and becomes less and less frequent um uh, as time goes by um um well assuming that you you have done your repetition up till then then you have your dual coding and that is what i'm failing to do now but i'm trying to do in general that you are supposed to have um besides having uh text uh, you need a picture you need something to hang up words on it works better if you have more than one input at a time what doesn't work is if if you have like a powerpoint slide and you only read text and um and and, and or you have a lot of text on it and you make your audience um, either listen to you or have the choice of either listening to you or reading the text that would be a bad uh, kind of uh, that would be against the dual coding um theory and and what you need is a picture and 
either some text where nobody's talking or a picture where you are talking um and in in, in this is in in learning it's usually like for powerpoint slides or it's for books where the text and picture comes in and powerpoint slides where the picture and um and and and, and speech uh, comes in okay um then you have some other topics in general learning that i will go through in the next uh, couple of slides so i won't go into these details here um, but it's about feedback and learn not to blame um, and about establishing safe container um, environments so that learning can be optimized just a quick word on one extra theory here on learning and i i urge you to go into St. Inland's blog on their uh, top 10 uh, learning theories as you need to know um, because they're great at this stuff and one of the things that um, is one of the really great theories that that is um, good to know about when teaching or when learning um, and also actually in clinical medicine is the cognitive load theory so what it says is that when we want to learn something or when you your patient wants to learn something uh, your patient in the emergency department uh, who you are trying to explain a relative complex topic to uh, about their body um, um, then you want to know about this um, this uh, particular theory so so the thing is when we're trying to learn something then you the load on your brain so to speak uh, is dealt into three categories extraneous load uh, intrinsic load and germane load and the intrinsic load is um, load that uh, it, it, that that depends on the topic at hand and your experience with that topic from before so your patient does might not know at all anything about the human body and you're trying to explain something um, to them uh, <laughs> uh, in a mm, more or less pedagogic, pedagogical language, um, and and if 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 you're not if if they are if you're new to a topic, then you need to um, then then you have a high intrinsic load, and you'll have to um, take that into account when when uh, having uh, to do with learners. Then you have your extraneous load, and that is the one that we want to maximize. That the extraneous load, from the extraneous load, we learn the things that we need to learn on a topic. So we want to maximize the extraneous load because that is what goes into uh, our brains, so to speak, and becomes um, memory. Um, and then you have your germane load, and that is the one that we want to reduce. And this is the one. This is the only one that we, we can actually reduce because the other two we cannot do much about. Um, because I mean, if it, uh, if a topic is complex and you haven't heard about it before, well, that's uh, that's where we have to start. And the other, the extraneous load, we can't do anything about either. But the germane load, that's all the clutter. That is um, your PowerPoint pres presenter um, standing in front of you and saying, "Well, this is a this is a busy slide." Uh, sorry for that and you will not learn anything from a busy slide because there's too much clutter um, and if you want to get really good at like reducing your germane load you need to be good at communication and you need to be good at presentation skills how to use your tone how to do presentations in general and i will um i will um, recommend uh, looking into ross fisher who has a homepage called Foliate um, and his P cubed um, approach. Then I will recommend going into like Seng Inlands, as I, I told you about the learning, le their learning block, and um, also um, the presentation Sen uh, Gar Reynolds um, has made a great book about this. And through this, we might be able to reduce our germane load. Um, and as you hear when i speak here uh, in especially in english i'm not very successful in doing this but um not ju just because i have not um 
accomplish this goal of being great at this. That doesn't mean that it's unachievable. And it's really um, a lot of people and a lot of great talkers are really, really good at this. So please look into these um, these, these um, recommendations if you are more interested in this. Okay, learning. Um, I usually try to talk about learning in two ways. There are uh, system two and system one, which um, comes from the, um, the dual process theory um, by Daniel Kahneman. And um, I've, I've, I've written extensively about this on the blog, but um, the main thing to take away here is when we when we in med school uh, or uh, when we in med school learn about a case, um, usually it's written out for us. That's that's um, then then we are actually testing mostly our system two, a bit system one, but mostly our system two. It's mostly our critical thinking and how to how to mitigate cognitive biases and uh, how to use uh, how to practice using forcing strategies and so on and so forth. That is what we do when we have a paper case, like a case where I'm presenting data to you. It's really really important to do these things, um, and that is what we will do here today. Um, the thing is, though, we often forget that there is a Another thing, when we go into the reality, because um, information, the information that we are gathering, that that is usually on the paper and that we assume are facts, are not as clear-cut facts when we are in in, in reality sitting uh, in a room with our patient, because then it's a complex thing. We need to be able to. Um, just for being stressed out and in an emergency department we need to be able to pick out the data that we need we need we, we might have be time pressure and so on and so forth and we might not be that good at communication so we don't, might not be able to extract what we need from the patient um, if we for instance only ask very specific uh, closed uh, narrow questions um, and so and there's the entire topic of being unknown, uh, the, the unknown unknowns that, especially if you're really new, you might not be able to pick up on anything because you don't know what you need to pick up on. You don't know what kind of illness scripts that you need to have in your, the back of your mind and listen for. So, so these are two very different ways of learning stuff. Um, and if we need to, we, 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 we really talk about the, how we, become better at seeing what we need to see or learning what we need to learn in a uh, system one fashion. Um, and that's why I'm bringing this up. Um, I'll just quickly go through the, some, 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 like, um, some links and some great um, pearls, I think, on the system two and system one in the next couple of slides here. And what we're going through today is, is system two. And because it's, I'm giving I'm feeding you the information, but the real challenge is usually how to how to practice this in, in, in practice this in real time and picking up on the information. And that is system one. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, the, the the pearls on the system two, like the paper cases when when our information is being fed. So, how can we improve our system two thinking? Well, there's the um, as I told you, there's a bias mitigation. Um, literature um, and that is like going through cases uh, especially Patrick Crosskery has done a great job on this uh, trying to teach how we uh, fall into um, biases cognitive and effective biases when we're going through cases and how we might mitigate um, this and we can do this through um, I'll show you a book that goes through these uh, things in a little while um, also, there's um, these topics for how we can improve our, our system two thinking. I, I love to talk about Bayesian probabilistic thinking, and that's why I'm doing this uh, video as well on this. And I've, I've already gone through a couple of cases where I've demonstrated um, in the part one and part two uh, how to think probabilistically. Um, and I'll try to do that in today's uh, cases as well in the here in part three. Um, then there is 
there is important to to like the general critical thinking like also outside of medicine being able to think critically and appraise um data and i think the um i was thinking one, one of the um one of the keys to doing that is is knowing about probabilistic thinking okay here are some uh, and to the right are some great links for how to improve our how our case-based learning um and what i love to do is uh, when we when we do cases is try to do a um, three-step method where you feed some information and then stop and then reflect in groups and then come back um to to, to and say like stop what, what what do we think up until now what are our differentials and then you might be able to draw out a bayesian table uh, trying to like what are the pretest probability of, of these things um, and you might do that at uh, different points in in the case in case you're going through depending on what kind of case it is um, it's very dynamic this but at some point I, I like to do that trying to stop and try to try to um, make the learners um, notice or think about like especially if it's a very obvious case this is a patient with pleuritic chest pain and who comes in with uh, dyspnea uh, in the history uh, she uh, she has um, she, she's taking the pill and she had previous uh, dvts in her family history so like um the <laughs> it's very hard not to think pulmonary embolism there but then i like to think then i like to ask the learners well exactly that's that's a great like that's a great thing to to think about that um first of all i i want them to share what how how do they how is their illness script how do how is their mind um mind mind illness script of a pulmonary embolism like what does that look like to them and we know that with more experienced learners they or more experienced clinicians they will have more nuanced uh illness scripts so that's that's, that's a really good tip to, to kind of know that you're on the same page uh, with your learners try to ask for their illness script especially if they're going uh, getting you some kind of diagnosis that it's not what you thought was obvious through the case like if if if, if, you, if they say in the case that i presented oh well, this, this might be a aortic section and it's not totally wrong that it's on the differential but it's not the highest ranking differential i would say so that they all ask well what um, how does your illness script of a aortic session look like and and then they will describe it and then i'll call it kind of um Put that data up and and compare it to the case that i presented so i'll ask well what is the um so 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 what kind of data points in this case um are in favor of this being an order dissection and what data points are not in favor of this being an order dissection so in that way you might be able to adjust their illness script um and uh, instead of just saying that no that is that is wrong um and it depends on the case and how much time you have but i think this is a very powerful method method described in judith bounds um great paper on edu educational theories and also in simon carley's um youtube um powerpoint slide called can we teach uh, clinical judgment and also in the uh, Soci society of improving diagnostic and med diagnostics in medicine their assessment of reasoning tool okay so so you present a bit of the case you take a pause and then you go further on along and then you take a um, one more pause maybe depending on what kind of case it is these pauses might be different um uh, different but going through in this way i think it's really really powerful because not only are you going to assess the learners especially if they're in different groups but you're also trying to in the room getting this feeling of well it's not like 50 percent of the room might go right and the, and the other 50 percent might go left and this implicitly tells you that clinical um judgment is different uh, and, uh, and 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 
even if we can agree on the facts um, of, of the case, then it might be different even so. And we'll go into like the, <laughs> the nuts and bolts of the threshold model that might explain some of these things. But it, it, this is, creates kind of a, what do you call a safe container as, as we'll talk about later um, for the learner to well, be aware that, that this is judgment, this is not algorithmic. Um, but when that's said, there, there are some answers that are more usually more true than others um, based on the information at hand. Um, and that's, that's, that's where the, 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 the learning uh, really lies and at how, how, how can we discuss what is the, the right way here. Um, yeah. So, and, and, and you go through it prospectively and that is really important because I mean, retrospectively, this might be Ah, oh, this is obvious. It's 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 a um, this is a um, this is a soster um, like a varicella soster um, pattern uh, skin condition, and this might be obvious after the facts, like the day after. But the, looking through the retro retrospectoscope, yeah, that is probably true. But but looking through it prospectively, saying that the patient came in with a um, with pain in her in, in, in her right um, abdominal region and there was just a bit of red there and not much and nothing else to see well I mean what kind of differentials are you going through there um, I bet they're a bit different than what you would be going through in your department okay so so this method is, is from the Danish Pediatric Society, and there's an English version there as well. If, if you want to go into their homepage and check that out, they've made a paper about it as well. But I think this kind of any, any kind of prospective um, going through cases with a kind of stop rule, and where you do a Bayesian analysis uh, of maybe two or three uh, differentials, um, maybe in emergency medicine, ranking them into the most uh, common and the most time critical because we're more we're more um, we're more interested in the time critical ones. That is a uh, that is my way of doing this, and I, I think um, from the literature is it's one of the uh, ways that uh, is, is 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 established in the literature as well as a, a as a good way to go through cases. Um, if you want to do this live, um, we have uh, emergency medicine core competences and I have a conflict of interest here because I'm part of this. Uh, I've been an instructor there for five years, but we'll, we're going through these things and trying to learn you this, uh, teach you this. Okay, and here was the book that I was talking about that um, because in these cases you might be able to pick out when people are framing or when people are um, um, if, if, if I give you a case where uh, the ambulance personnel comes in and says, well, this patient is ceasing, uh, um, has, epilep has epilepsy and, and, and is, is now ha having an epileptic seizure, then I, what I'm doing there is I'm creating an, um, a risk of both diagnostic momentum that, well, I as a doctor in the emergency room will just go by the information that my ambulance driver gave me and assume that there, there has been an epileptic seizure when actually I need to take a step back or there, there is, it, there, there's a, um, there are brackets around in my head, there are brackets around that kind of information. Not that I don't, um, trust our ambulance, um, paramedics uh, because they're great. Um, but because the information early on in an encounter has brackets around it. Uh, it's 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 kind of there's like confident in, confidence intervals. It's it's well this might be thirty percent true, but I need to back a bit. Like when when they say it's an epileptic seizure, I have a forcing strategy telling me that I have to. This is a some kind of episodic event. But it but but going to the this is a epileptic seizure too early. Um, then I might be framing my uh, sorry not framing but I might be premature closing, um, and that that like these cases can be a great way of trying to like both teach these things and making it making people more aware of these kind of cognitive biases. Well, this this book is full of this book is full of these, and I I don't receive any money from any of these uh, <laughs> uh, any of these companies, but I I, I highly uh, recommend going into these. 
uh, kind of cases to learn this and l read and listen to Pat Crossgrey's um, um, lectures and, and read his books about these things. Foam is a, another great way of doing this and uh, I wouldn't have learned all of this if I had not uh, been on the foam. And this was just this great article I, I, I talked about uh, earlier, the um, Judith Bowen Educational Theories to the Strategy to Promote Clinical Diagnostic Reasoning. And also in the emergency um, cases teaching on shift episode, there are great tools how to in 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 the um in the everyday try to teach people uh like teach people this kind of method how to how to through 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 the presentation of a case um to you by a um, medical student or or a, a junior doctor or whoever you can kind of change your mind about what an illness script looks like um, and that's much more powerful than just saying, well, do that. It's, it's about asking what they call diverging questions that make them makes them think instead of just giving them the answer. And that's what I try to explain here. But look at the links. Uh, there are much more inf there's much more, much more information on, on, on this uh, in the teaching on shift um, uh, episode. Okay, and this was the uh, IDM uh, assessment and reasoning tool, which is kind of what I just went through as well. It's on YouTube. Simon Carley um, often talks about this, and I, I really think it's, it's a really, really good point he has about it. So let's say like the usual cases that we hear in the everyday clinic, especially in emergency medicine, is is when it really is it, either it has gone horribly wrong and it's kind of a it's, it's, been, it's become it's become a case where it's like kind of a mortality mortal, mortality and morbidity conference kind of thing, where you have to well, go through the case and it's horrid and why did that mistake happen or was it the mistake and so, so on and so forth. Um, or we hear about cases where we did something awesome, like that was a great save and we we made an awesome diagnosis. And these both of these are really really important to talk about and they're also interesting because here's the there's a fear here and there's a wow how can i be a, as good as that kind of kind of vibe but actually most of most of our cases are here and simon carly usually uh, talks about if if like this is like learning to fly by only researching the crashes and researching the aerobatics but the meat of everything we do is here it's the 95 percent it's the it's the um, urinary tract infection that we send home with antibiotics instead of admitting them. And why did we do that? Well, why don't we talk about that? It doesn't categorize here or here. Why are we thinking as we are? That is that's really important to think about. And if, if you go through the cases as I just described, then no case is not interesting it's always either some kind of biases or some kind of uh, you, you you tried it in uh, tried in, in tried it as, uh, in your department and you'll see people have very different ways of doing this and maybe sometimes when things are people are very different on doing things then it really doesn't matter how we do it and then we might question why we have such strict guidelines on certain aspects of what we do if if, it, if, if there is such a variety uh, among people. Um, here, are the, here are the links to, to some of these uh, um, great lectures by Simon Carley uh, that I uh, recommend. Okay, so let's, that was like the system two, uh, I am feeding your data kind of thinking. Uh, and the, like the case presentation, but but let's move into the the room where you are with the patient, and you need to collect the data, and then you have to do what I just told you about, like uh, interpreting the data and and trying to come up with differentials. But how do we pick up this data? And that is much more system one based, 
Um, and when I'm saying system one, I mean both communication, um, nonverbal and verbal and tone. I'm talking about how to perform under pressure and try to like be open so that you do get the information that you, so you're not narrowing into, I'm, I'm going to, to do a, uh, or, or you, you, you miss everything to, you, you, you miss, um, you miss doing, um, you, you, you missed your shot to getting some kind of information because um, you are distracted. Um, you're not aware of um, what the patient is saying to you or you're, you're, you're thinking about your last patient, so on and so forth. Um, so let's try to go through that. The thing is, um, and this is more like in the resource setting, we say that we fall to the level of our training. We don't, we don't magically uh, get more skilled um, when we are in, in, in very hard situations uh, beyond or at the border of our comfort zone, unless we have trained it. Um, so, so it's really important that we train these things that I'm going to go through here. And um, a thing that I'm not going to go through is communication, but I put a link in the part one and part two to my video on communication and probably sick thinking and headache where I go through this in detail and why this is so important as well. Okay, so let's go through these things. So how do we improve our system one? And also this is part of a resource thing as well. So that's why I have the team. How do we improve our team effort as well? So there's this thing about performance under pressure, which I will go through um, on, in, the next, in the next slide. So I'll jump, uh, I'll skip that for now. But there's the visual, visualization and preparation to fail. And this is something that Chris Hatfield, among others, and um, Chris Hicks talks about. And um, uh, Martin Bromley talks about visualization is like in, when, they, when they fly, you have to armchair, armchair fly like every day or every week, a couple of hours, where you in your mind go through the steps that you need to take and you try to create this in your mind. It's not just like you you, have, you can elaborate on how you're doing your scenario so if you if you fear a scenario going into the emergency department like i i for a long time used to fear um having a patient with hyponatremic uh, status status epilepticus because i didn't know how to treat hyponatremia um but after going through it in my head and knowing in the emergency department, my department, where this stuff was and what, how, how I was going to mix the hypertonic, um, hypertonic uh, natrium chloride, uh, sodium chloride, um, it, it, it became less of a fear. And then when I finally had a case like that, I, I knew um, at least I, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't panic because I knew where to go, what kind of links I had to look up and then uh, check it out. It doesn't always work and it, it didn't work perfectly for me this time, but, but this is a way to kind of test these things that are kind of rare that we don't get as much. Um, and yeah, visualization practices are, are essential. Then there is this, um, these two concepts, fly, train, train as you fly. Uh, in, uh, and, and that's more like when you are, when, when we're trying to, te when, when we're trying to learn in a simulation environment, a resource simulation or a communication environment, uh, where, where, where we're trying to communicate with the patient and get video feedback and so on, we have to fly as we train and train as we fly, we have to have the same equipment as we have in our, our own department. The, the, the simulation has to be as true to reality as possible uh, so that when you have to train something really well and you go in, in the training setting and you go into real life and then you find out, well, um, well, this procedure, uh, this, this, uh, this tool didn't look like the one I, I used to like your defibrillator has uh, nine buttons on it instead of the three that we practice. How am I going to do that? Like then, then you're, then you, um, then you are in a disadvantage, uh, compared to what you would have been if you had that in the training environment. So fly should train, train should fly. When you simulate anything, try to go as, as close to reality as possible and try to mitigate when you can't by having pictures or by having something like that. 
um, so that you know what it looks like in the situation. Because that's usually how, what shocks us in the situation when we don't know. That's what cognitive loads us when we don't know how things looks like. Um, and there will always be some uncertainty, that, but that we need to use our cognitive ability on that uncertainty instead of having uncertainty about the things that we could have prepared for. Um, and uh, that is, uh, Chris Hatfield talks about like planning to fail. Um, you can look up his video on, uh, on YouTube about um, on, where he's interviewed by London, London Real, uh, where he talks about this uh, concept. Okay, um, then there is the um, peer review and spotting the right. And this is all about feedback in the situation. I, and, and I'll talk about that later, so I'll, I'll skip that. And instead, go to this how do we how do we perform under pressure thing. This is a model from um, that I borrowed from Chris uh, Hicks's uh, article um, on human factors in trauma. And in general, it's like this: there's a lot of noise um, when we are doing a task. It might be actual noise, it might be the time pressure, it might be the task load that we have like six or seven or ten patients, and it might be. Um, some kind of uh, threat as well, um, and that might be a um, abstract threat, like um, well, a uh, threat of being sued if we do something wrong, or it might be a more actual threat of a patient that is ranting, uh, like, or sorry, that is um, being violent and so on. So you have a lot of input into your own brain, and you're uh, in your brain, you're trying to appraise this kind of uh, like like you you're doing this kind of appraisal and and the the result of this appraisal uh, takes two ways either you you assess this as a threat or you think that your demands the demands in the situation are above what you actually can do and that will mean that your stress level um, becomes uh, high and if your stress level can become high there's a risk of you not performing as you should and the other way is that you think that your resources um, um, are are um, um, more than what is demanded in the situation, then it's it, then it's good. Then you are in. Then you might be in a flow state where you can where you are challenged, but um, not too much uh, to perform. Um, so, and then then the output is is this like you have a this, this is the cognitive diamond that we talked about: uh, psychological, physiological, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral. Like you have a, um, some people go off the rails if they are stressed. Some people, we all have some kind of stress response. And if you want to re really know, <laughs> dig into this, uh, you can check out uh, Jocko Willink's podcasts um, that are that, that are amazing on on these kind of things. Um, but in general, it, this is um, this is our response, and often we have to be aware that we are using it. I mean, this is not a this is a subconscious. Uh, kind of, this is a subconscious process usually, and we need to be aware if we are, if we are uh, going off the rails in any of these, like shouting at people or being very emotional or, or narrowing in, uh, like being cognitive overloaded. And then we have to take a step back and do some of these things that we can do in the situation. Um, and there's there's some things that you can do in the situation, and there are some things that you can do before the situation. And before the situation might be like uh, like I told uh, like I told before, visualization, doing doing checklists like on the basic stuff that you need to know in the situation, so that you don't have to make it out, make it on the go, like practicing in simulations, so on and so forth, knowing who who to call. Um, that's how you can prepare for a situation. But in the situation, you might not be able to totally prepare, and you will still be stressed if, um, for instance, a child comes in where they. And if and a, a, a wound a wound in, on the a knife against a knife in their thorax or something like that, um, and how do how how do how to deal with that? Well, how do how do how do you get from you think that the demands are too high, even if even if you've been, you've been preparing all the way, um, to thinking that you do have the resources, um, and well, uh, Chris. Um, um, Chris Hicks uh, and, and, and others, uh, especially uh, Mike Loria, has talked about this model called um, Beat the Stress Fool. And Beat the Stress Fool is um, just a mnemonic on some psychological um, cognitive 
um, practices that you can that you might um, use in such such a situation to get yourself under control um, and you can use some of these or all of these uh, I usually use um, breathing which would be some kind of breathing that is um, mindful breathing such as or deep breathing such as uh, box breathing where you take a deep breath in uh, hold it for three or four seconds and then you t take a deep uh, th th then you exhale and then then you hold for four, three or four seconds then and you then you that's the box so so four seconds four seconds four seconds four seconds or whichever rhythm that suits you um, and then do that for uh, a little while and then then you usually can go on Jocko Willing talks about do this like breathe like he has he has three steps breathe and then uh, when you when you've been breathing then orientate yourself that's uh, and then act as the third one so and I, I usually use Jocko Willings instead of this BCSF but I just wanted to show you this BCSF um, because there's also um, the talk where you some people are very has a very negative um, inner monologue about themselves like this is never going to work we are I'm going to fail this and you can turn that around by trying to either reframe or trying to try to practice or even catch yourself in doing this and trying to say no I can't do this this is this is going to be okay I, I've trained this and so on and so forth and then there's the menstrual rehearsal which is visualization and I encourage you if you want to do good visualization practices then I encourage you to read this paper because it goes through how to really go into like sitting at home really going into uh, how, how, how to visualize that you are there and, and getting the most out of your visualization practices then um, then there's the focus thing and you, you um, uh, when you're just about to do a procedure then you might want to be in total focus and you want to say like something like smooth as uh, as um, as Scott Weingart has uh, his trigger word like something that like in the in a, in a pinpoint of a second like um, uh, focus your mind to the task at hand um, okay the last two boxes here is shadow boxing and active listening and active listening I'm saying this very broad because this is something to do about being really good at seeing what others don't and this is something that we practice through peer review and through doing video recordings and um, I encourage you to look up uh, Scott Weingart's um, interview and, and like uh, deliberation on um, the book Peak with uh, with um, I think Anders Ericsson yeah um, shadow boxing is is uh, Gary Klein's idea uh, a cognitive psychologist um, who also has been speaking with Ian, yeah, for, with uh, Scott Weingart on Ian Crit, um, and he talks about the problem with someone who is an expert who should who who is good at seeing what others others don't is that it's kind of hard to teach uh, others this kind of gestalt or this kind of how did you know that this this uh, how uh, Gary Klein has has uh, has, um, has researched a lot of, on on um, on firefighters and and uh, usually asks like how did you know that this this burning building was going to um, like burst into flames and, and and like you have to get your men out um, and usually they cannot explain it at the like right there and then but if you film if you film it and you let an ex the, the same person go through it then usually uh, they can do what he called what, what he's, he's termed or coined shadow boxing um, where, where where a novice learner can look at the same video and then the expert who was in the scenario um, or a different scenario can, can 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 explain what they are thinking at the time uh, in a way that they usually wouldn't if you just ask them what did you do in this situation so so shadow boxing is one method uh, I think is really powerful or has the potential to be really powerful at learning at, at teaching us this um, system one kind of thinking and seeing what we should in a resource environment but also in a in this topic a more neurological environment and in, in and in neurology in general 
uh, when I worked in neurology, they have a great tradition of doing bedside um, bedside teaching where they uh, where, where they go where they where you see with your own eyes what what they are doing uh, to uh, to get these neurological findings uh, out in the open and, and and getting the diagnosis. So that's, that's those are great great teaching um, teaching points that we should use more in the emergency medicine. I think. Um, even going so far that I think we should um, um, push to get uh, license, licensing to actually film some of the encounters that we are seeing in the resource room so that we can learn even more for the patient's benefit. Um, um, and then um, if you want to know more about that, check out um, Scott Weingart's um, post with uh, Anders Ericsson. Okay, um, another way of doing this system one could be uh, Simon Carley talks about get someone, uh, one of your learners into a room with you during, during a recess, or you can go there yourself and just look at the patient. Don't look at the screen uh, with vital signs. Don't look at everything happening around you. Just look at the patient and try to pick out what kind of things that are going on with the patient. And whether and try to make up make your mind up on um, whether this patient is sick or what Scott Weingart calls like uh, LSS one, uh, sorry LLS one looks like shit, <laughs> and um, because then then you will, might be able to train yourself to like look at stuff like well they're sweating they're, they they are actually um, not just ha they're not just having a high respiratory frequency they're actually breathing in a sp in a pattern that seems laborious they're actually they're, you might notice or become good at noticing some of these small nuances that um, a novice learner would otherwise not i had a situation the other day when when i had a person uh, a, pa a patient coming in in status epilepticus where i was supervising a younger um, colleague uh, going through um, one of her first uh, abc scenarios recess scenarios and um one of the one of the, like like um, i'm not calling myself an expert but I've, I've i've seen a couple of status epilepticuses and and i remember how like the I, I like seeing this in real time when when I quite quickly came to like the pattern of what we are going to do um, when she was still going through a kind of a top down sorry bottom up kind of way like, well, um, uh, doing the ABCs and doing which was great um, but this is this is like at the novice level and when you get better and better you might be able to see these patterns that, that is the gestalt that is, uh, and, and if you ask me what was the reason why you could see that this was going to be well i it's hard to explain in this situation and that's why this shadow boxing and filming might be a great tool okay this is gary klein and I just wanted to show you that, uh, like, please check out the EM Crit um, podcasts on this by, because I think they're great. He's made, made an entire book and called Street Lights and Street Lights and Shadows, which I read and is one of my favorites on this topic. And then check out Scott Weingart's OODA Loops and Bread Baking. It's a great lecture going through this concept and also why guidelines in these complex situations are almost useless. And it's probably, and algorithms are probably making us worse off at a certain point in our training. Okay. This has also something to do with leadership, and I will go, go through leadership in a, in a little way, in a little while. Um, but on leader, my take home points about leadership are these five, um, and, and we'll, we'll go through these. So that's talk about leadership and why leadership what what leadership has to do with anything uh, about case-based learning and and so on and so forth it, it's but I'll, i might be able to convince you that it actually has a lot to do about it and maybe actually essential to know about um 
I am no leader, um, or at, at least not an expert leader. I try to be good at my leadership skills, but I am no expert leader. Um, um, my my knowledge uh, about leadership comes from, well, some experience with it in the in, in the emergency department, but um, mainly theoretically through um, these books. Uh, uh, Chris Hatfield's Astronaut Guide to Life on Earth, Daniel Coyle's, Coyle's uh, Culture Code, and and Jack Hovelink's. Um, I haven't read this one uh, yet, but I've uh, I frequently listen to his podcasts where he goes through a lot of the uh, concepts. Um, and then there's if you want to have a summarization of especially Daniel Coyle's book, but all of these books kind of say the same thing um, in different ways. Then this quick podcast on Rob Orman's stimulus podcast, how to be an effective leader, kind of sums a lot of it up. So if you want to do the quick way, then try to check that out. Okay. Also, a concept that uh, is not taught in any of these books, but is like behind the scenes in all of the books, is the concept of complexity. And and uh, no, like if you want to be introduced to complexity, I will do this uh, in a couple of slides. But uh, there's a good podcast on complexity by Jeffrey Braithwaite uh, in how to think about complexity in healthcare systems. Okay, so leadership um, can be boiled down to maybe these three points. And there are a lot of ways to do leadership. There are lots of uh, situations that might demand different kind of leadership and so on and so forth. But I think these are central no matter what. Um, I think there's a problem that a leader is usually seen as the uh, the guy on the horse in front of the army, like shouting orders and and saying what should be done. And I mean, if if you want any kind of like depiction of a leader, try to listen to Jocko Willink and how he like he looks like someone who should be like that but isn't um, there is there is much more power in being a leader i think who um, is is behind the scenes kind of he is, is visible and and the, lead, the leader's job is kind of to make the best uh, out of his uh, employees um and the leader is not supposed um himself or herself to actually perform the task so don't micromanage it um be able to encourage your your um your 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 employees to actually be able to be um be empowered in the situation so that they can come so that they can um do the things necessary in this complex situation where you have no oversight at all uh, no matter how much you want to, especially because it's a complex system, a complex situation usually, demanding their own judgment. So this is from Daniel Coyle's book, and I've changed it a little bit, but in general, the three things are that are important are belonging, creating belonging, so that people feel like they belong at your team. Um, and then there is this thing about feedback, vulnerability loops, and psychological safety, how we create a good environment so that we can learn and get feedback and, and not be afraid to say what we think. Um, and then there's the having a clear direction. And that is important um, because um, we are going into complex situations. And, and if your employees are going into complex situations, then then you can never have this oversight, as I, uh, as I just said. And well, then you need some kind of clear mind map in these complex situations that should guide you. Like, should I, in a patient encounter, should I think about, um, so should I think about doing the test that is the least expensive? Like think about money, is that a priority? Or are they, or is the priority to get the best patient care or is it, like these are not things that can be taught in each and every situation you have to like get the like what we might call the big stones the principles and these principles should be quite clear 
because if they're not it's kind of like teaching a child <laughs> if they're not clear then there there will be confusion so so these are the three things that are really important in, in leadership i think I, there, there's lots of more lots more but i'll try to go, go through these and and the belonging thing I encourage you to l listen to Daniel Coyle. Um, I think he can explain that better than I can, but it's mainly just going uh, into a group and feeling that you're belonging, like almost a family connection, kind of like that, um, that you got each other's backs. So I'll, instead, I'll delve into this feedback thing, um, which I think is <laughs> in all assets of life really important. If you want to know more about feedback in general, I, I encourage you to listen or uh, read uh, St. Imland's feedback uh, um, blogs. There are several of those. Um, or read the thanks for the feedback or l check their YouTube videos by Sheila Heen and Douglas Stone. Um, and Simon Carley has even done a um, YouTube video as well on this topic, Coach Your Team. And um, these are all great. Um, why is feedback so important? Well, this is the Dunning-Kruger effect, and the Dunning-Kruger effect, at least graphically, um, popularized like this. And the Dunning-Kruger effect is like this: you think that you have a competence, um, and your competence uh, here on the x-axis um, is is usually um, quite low in the beginning of your uh, your career, and then. Uh, it will be average later on, and if you get on this path of deliberate practice, the path, pathway of insanity, as Scott Weingart uh, calls it, then um, then you might become an expert at some point. And it's hard to know when, and I'll that there is a great paper on how to know when, um, the, the, uh, by by Daniel Kahneman and Gary Klein, called uh, a failure to disagree, I think, um, but. The thing is, confidence levels vary over this time when you're gaining your experience um, and expertise on your way to expertise. Because in the beginning of something, you will think you're you're worth nothing. But once you've seen a couple of cases, you'll think you're great. You can I can handle every hypernatremia now. Uh, in status of status of hypernatremia, I can handle everything there. And you think you're great because you treated maybe two, and but suddenly you'll know that it's more complex than that. Oh, well, he's still ceasing, but he did actually, um, he did actually uh, get his max dose. Uh, have I thought about everything and, and so on and so forth. So you'll get into this valley of despair that when you think that this pro this proportionally sometimes that you don't know anything that might, that might even go to the, uh, to the lowest point where you have like some kind of imposter syndrome and then you're going up maybe if you get good teaching and that's why I'm doing this blog as well to, to teach you the tools and and links to get on with this path um, which we are all on okay so but why feed, why is feedback so important well um, we have blind spots we have um, we have blind spots for everything. Um, like we have known knowns, we have unknown, uh, we have known knowns, we have known unknowns, things that we know that we don't know. And then we have unknown unknowns, things that we don't know that we do every day. Like, uh, for instance, I don't know about my mannerisms when I'm talking to you guys, um, unless I record it. That's why our voices sound so strange when we're recording it. And I use often, often to a point where you cannot recognize yourself. Um, and that's why we, that, that's why we have, that's because we have blind spots for everything in, in, in what we do. And we're, we're, we, we might be able to through reflection to actually to see some of these, but we're quite bad at seeing these and what we actually need is others because others are, as you might know, really, really good at picking out the stuff that you're doing wrong, and and, and but they're 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 good at seeing what what you don't see because you are invested in another way. So that's why feedback is so important because we need everyone to tell us what is wrong or what we're doing wrong. But in order to them for for them to do this, we need to 
create an environment where it's okay to give us feedback and that is entirely up to you first of all but also we need to as a receiver of feedback be able to reflect and not go havoc uh, not, not go havoc uh, on, on like like not, not not be totally um totally defensive about everything we hear so how do we achieve these two things like not being too defensive when we when we're hearing feedback and actually gaining knowledge when someone is giving us feedback even though it's horribly delivered and it's it's the wrong person and the wrong time and so on and and how, how, how do we do this so that's what i'm going to go through here um so there's a difference between receiving feedback and giving feedback and 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 one of the main points here is that receiving feedback feedback is like a I sometimes talk about feedback being like a river that you can stick your head into if you want to on this and in on but you don't have to so there's feedback all over if someone doesn't sit behind besides you then there is a bit of feedback there it, it's it's a it's a very noisy data set because it might be because you're smelling <laughs> um or or it might be because um some totally unrelated reason but if if the same thing happens a lot like nobody ever wants to sit beside you um then then there might be a pattern and then then it, then there, this is some kind of inform informal feedback that you can actually as i say stick your head into and try to listen in on but you need to be able to listen in on in this and um getting yourself to a place where you can actually do that that's hard but the receiving part is the most important um in in that's one of the take-home points in Th thanks for the feedback um, book and also from Simon Carley's lectures and, and, and courses. Um, but you should also know how to give feedback because, because there are very important points here as well. So let's go through the giving first. Okay, so ACE is the mnemonic. There are three kinds of feedback. And Simon Carley usually uh, tells us this. Um, if, you are, if you're a tennis player, like um, Roger Federer, you will want to have a coach i mean um because otherwise you will never get to otherwise you'll never get better you'll never ne you'll never see your weaknesses or you'll never see your blind spots uh, so even the most expert at anything will need a coach to become to become better the coach doesn't need to be an expert at the thing that they're teaching they don't just need to be an expert coach or they just need to be a good coach um, uh, both in communication and to seeing what they need to see and knowing more where the the trainee needs to go so 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 it's, it's hugely important this um for every like both from novices and for experts okay so there, there's three kinds of feedback um and this is from the both from simon carly and, and from the book uh thanks for the feedback and you can remember it by ace there's appreciation feedback there's coaching and there's evaluation. So appreciation feedback, that is something that you want to be doing almost all day because this is also kind of a compassionate care kind of thing. You want to say when people are doing the right thing or doing great stuff, you want to, you want to show them appreciation. And there's lots of appreciation to show them because people are usually doing a great job. Um, and if you if you don't think there are, then you're probably not seeing or act actively listening to what they're doing or seeing or, or sorry saying or um, you're not seeing your colleagues. You might be in a, in your own bubble. So um, and it's important when you do give appreciation feedback, like um, it, it, it it's not formal. It's just. Hey, great! Great that you saw that. I, I wouldn't have seen that. I, I, I saw that you uh, saw a, a a small problem with that patient, and, and you you picked up on, it and then you, you did that, that. That was great. Thanks. Um, um, I uh, that that is like small piece of a, like informal appreciation feedback you, that you that you you can do every day uh, if you, if you pick up on it so the, the actively listening thing is really important and it's important to say why you think it's good that they did that like i saw you do this that is really good because um because if it's i mean to some extent it's good also just to say well that was good 
but if but but uh, in general it's it more powerful if you if you can tell them why it was good it also be, uh, comes off as more genuine and you want to be genuine here uh, it's not you, you should not be disingenuine <laughs> of course there's also always the thing fake it till you make it but in general i think being genuine is what gets you the furthest in this and you have to work with yourself to go to a place where you can actually be genuine with your colleagues and appreciation appreciate them and that be, might be for, by, that might be through self exploration first and um, so on but uh, that is that is important and simon Crowley actually t talks about this 5 to 1 ratio because if you don't preach appre do appreciation for people then they will usually not take as well when you get to the coaching thing <laughs> um when you when, when you need to give them some kind of feedback um then they will take it quite hard, harshly um and he usually he, he, he used to say three to one i think and then he went up to five to one like every time you give one piece of coaching advice you will have to do five appreciations um don't do the maths or don't calculate it but like as a as a rule of thumb and and we should in general be grateful and appreciative of, of our colleagues but this is a even more motivating factor for that okay so that's enough about appreciation i think it's so important so that's why i'm talking so much about it then there's the coaching and that is the actual feedback that we might think about coaching ha co coaching is neutral it is saying like you should take a step to the left or a step to the right next time or you should do a, a jump up or jump down or something like that jump down not jump down but you should jump up uh, and do it like this is it is neutral it should not be loaded with negative uh, it should not be are oh, you so stupid why didn't you do that you should have done that that it, it if you're a good receiver then you might be able to ignore that kind of stuff but in general it it, it gets better it gets lot less cluttered you have less germane load on that part uh, that information if you can give the coaching neutrally especially on a background of five to one appreciation uh, beforehand um and then there's the evaluation and evaluation is usually what we think about when we think about feedback because that is when you're sitting down at the table and and doing um a um evaluation where everyone has come with feedback to the to your boss and you're you're being evaluated uh, and and compared to your peers evaluation is a comparison to to some kind of benchmark um and that is always scary um and can be uh, can, can be really intimidating but um if you do the other two kinds of feedback right then this is good as then, then usually this is good it's important as a receiver of feedback to actually you, you should not just take the feedback you need to explore why are they saying this um, like you need to understand the feedback and in order to understand the feedback you need to often ask questions follow-up questions on why they're saying as they are okay so um for instance you are giving uh, the feedback that you should um do one thing you should you you, you should um, compress the chest better um, next time and that's kind of a f a f um, fluffy feedback like how should i compress the chest better well you should you should put your hands here and, and then, then through this conversation you might find out that well okay that that was actually a good point so 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 uh, it's important these things to 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 actually know what the other person is saying to you and through questioning so then there then there's these general rules when you are giving feedback in journal it's don't mix these three i mean you there are always some mixture there's always some evaluation in in the coaching and the appreciation there's always like some kind of benchmarking but in general you should try to keep them apart so when you are doing an appreciation you should not do like the shit the shit sandwich like oh this was good then you should do this and but it's all right you should try to keep them apart so when you're doing a simulation for instance you should 
probably like do a pre-brief where you are doing like appreciation. And then when you go into the setting, you should actually do the coaching, just like do this, do this, do this. In, instead of mixing the two. That is uh, that is at least the advice from Sheila Heen and, and Dr. Stone. Um, because it's it gets the, the messaging gets messy if, if you if you kind of uh, mix it up. People if 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 you're evaluating someone they will you and you appreciate them before before you might only hear the appreciation and if if you're, if you're coaching them uh, then you, they might hear only negative stuff so so keep them apart um, um, in the in the particular situation yeah and we already talked about the five to one rule then there is the thing about the emergent feedback when if if uh, so let's go into if, if you have someone who needs like feedback right now. You don't have time to think about um, should I give it now or so on. Then you can do what is called a giraffe method, and the giraffe method method is like this: uh, agree on the facts. I um, you, you can read this yourself, but it's a good way to like. Usually, giraffes have like um, saying them this usually say like giraffe ha giraffes has big hearts um, and has overview, right? So you do it with an empath you do it with empathy, um, and you try to have over you over the situation and try to not tell fact-based things like you did this you should instead tell them like i saw this could you explain why that was or like um i, I was saying yeah that is the that's the general way of doing this giraffe kind of feedback and and then um Please read through this block, testing, testing, making feedback more than just noise. And saying that means um, to, to know more about this kind of feedback. In the emergent situations where you cannot do what you usually should do, which is what is com comes next here, what, which is think about, is feedback necessary here? Is it the right time? Is it the right place? And am, am I in the right frame of mind doing this feedback? And part of this preparation is also like doing a decent appreciation of your patients and actually of, of your of your trainees before um, the fact that you have to give them a specific coaching feedback for instance so they know that you, they belong to the team so to speak and they are appreciated that was that belonging thing again um, okay this is just an example um i did a course in sang uh, a little while back where they try to exemplify this where you, where i went outside and the rest of the team was inside and they had hidden an apple somewhere i didn't know this but they had and uh, sorry i didn't know the location of this apple but when i went into the room um they were they had been taught uh, taught to give me um so one kind of feedback and we were three people outside the door and the first one going in only received appreciation feedback the second one coming in only uh, uh received evaluation feedback and me <laughs> i was the lucky one here i only uh, received coaching feedback and when you only uh, receive when you're standing in a room where you have to find an apple and all of the ones all the people who actually witnessed how this was done and where it is only are allowed to give you appreciation feedback then then it doesn't work really um and so they will say oh good job you're doing such a good job just keep doing what you're doing it's it, i i love that and 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 they they wouldn't find the apple <laughs> uh, then the evaluation feedback is more like or then usually it's i might be thinking this wrong but the, the next guy um came in and and, and got um very um, negative like mixed coaching and evaluation feedback like oh it's right there can't you see the you you, you stupid uh, idiot or like and, and <laughs> having a huge room telling you so, uh, this this really hurts even in that scenario they had to like debrief the person going through that because it's really really harmful to 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 go through this and uh, we'll talk about anti-fragility later but and, and how to like survive in this environment but this is part of it um this is a great scenario to go through um to, to like pinpoint this this um this theme okay and then i went into the room um 
and I had only I, I was told only to be getting neutral coaching feedback, neutral coaching, um, not negative coaching, coaching as 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 the guy before me. Um, so neutral coaching was only in this case like up, right, left, <laughs> and and then they said when I was getting warmer, warmer, closer. Other. So so and and then I I found the apple within a few seconds, not because of my skills at finding apples, but because of their feedback. So this case illustrates a lot of things. This, this, this exercise ex illustrates a lot of things, but among other, it illustrates that um, different feedback is, diff is, is needed for different situations. And coaching feedback is what we usually need in the emergency department when we are being taught something. But it needs to be neutral and we need to have this appreciation background. So we feel a psychological safety and we feel a belonging. Um, yeah. Okay, back to the Dunning-Kruger effect, because if we, and, 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 and back to like being a receiver, because now we talk, right now we talk mostly about being uh, a giver of feedback, but let's try to talk about being the receiver, because that is the most important, actually. And usually when you get feedback, you will have this effective response in the beginning, like, what what Sheila Heen and Dr. Stone calls wrong spotting. Like you pick out everything that is wrong. This is the wrong person giving me this feedback. This is the wrong time. Why is this happening right now? And, what, I, I, and, and it is perfectly okay to say, I can't take this feedback right now. That is really important. It's okay to say, I, I, I cannot take this feedback or I won't accept that tone. You shouldn't accept any everything, but you cannot choose your feedback usually. And, and remember there is formal and informal feedback. Like, so sometimes you, you don't know that it's feedback unless you become aware of it. So it's, you have to set boundaries if you don't want that, that specific tone um, and so on. And it's okay to say no, but in general, if you're receiving some kind of feedback and you, you are like, they are kind of polite about it, then usually you will, no matter how polite they are, if they're hitting on your own, um, like something that you're proud of or something that you really have struggled with, or, um, then, then you will become defensive. That is perfectly normal and that is almost everyone will become defensive right after you, you've received some kind of feedback and you need to know that that's period of time you should try to understand what the feedback is about but 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 not try to like try to understand what they're saying right so, so you have to be able to summarize what they're actually saying that's incredibly hard i think it's jordan peterson who has who's talked about active listening as well and being able to when you're hearing something from someone else you should be able to make their arguments even better you have to listen to their what they're saying you have to make uh like be able to summarize what they're saying and then make your argument even better if uh, <laughs> that that means you're actively listening and that will make uh, your conversation run more, much more smoothly um, because then 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 you're actually on the same page when you're talking so so but but when when receiving feedback you will actually get this kind of yeah this affective um, oh that is not wrong that is that's totally wrong that is wrong that is wrong um, I I am not taking this and what what the the feedback book um, urges you to do is is this. What, uh, what they call uh, and Simon Carly calls and I've called in the blocks spotting the right because it, it, it's very well true that a lot of these things might be wrong. Maybe most of it is wrong. But if you can pick out just one or two percent from this this thing that they're telling you, then 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 two plus two plus two like incrementally will add up to a lot of things. And you will learn, even though you're getting horrible feedback. Okay, so spotting the right is a good mindset of going into a conversation with, because, and and if you want to like in a broader perspective know about this, then then please look up Jonathan Hates, and and how like the left and the right political politically are tearing each other apart because we are not able to kind of listen to each other and spot the right 
but we are able to like sit in these echo chambers instead and agree with ourselves um, and not being able to pinpoint our blind spots. So please look up Jonathan Hayes. I will, I will say a little bit about him uh, later, but like the spotting the right concept in emergency medicine and in general when receiving feedback is so essential. Okay, and then there's this concept I've talked about by about psychological safety, and I will just quickly talk about the uh, New York Karolinska, uh, the, um, the the Swedish, the Stockholm's uh, uh, like most expensive hospital, uh, and why it's so necessary for for having a good feedback environment. Um, okay, and I, um, I usually talk about safe container, but psychological safety or safe container. Um, whichever, it's the same thing. It's about creating a, um, a space where you're not afraid to give feedback. Um, and let's talk about how to create that. So there's in Daniel Coyle's book, The Culture Code, there's this concept, which I, I think most of us inherently might know about, but maybe have never heard about formally called the vulnerability loop. Okay, so our vulnerability loop is this. If you have two people in a room, um, and oh, sorry, let's let's start with the example because in Daniel Coyle's book they they have this example where they did an experiment where they have several rooms where they um, uh, 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 several experiments where they have um, a meeting and uh, then they had placed one guy in that those meetings where they had to perform you know, they had to do something perform a task and in the room where there was just one person being extremely negative, um, the production would just go down right away and they would not get anything done. It didn't take a lot of negativity to not get anything done. Besides in the, in the rooms where there were a person in the group that created vulnerability loops. Because that made the environment less toxic and much more appreciative of different viewpoints. Okay, let's let, let's go through this. What what the vulnerability loop is? So if you have a person here on the left who is um, sending some kind of vulnerability sign, let's say I made a mistake, um, and the person listening to him is detecting this signal and maybe even validating the signal and might be using the give mnemonic that uh, Laura Rock talks about in the mastering uh, mastering um, intensive care and I've talked about in, in the, my uh, lecture on communication and um, head headache and probabilistic thinking. Then, 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 well, message received. Um, you you made a mistake. That's that's. I mean, we all do that. I, I actually, we, we all do that. And and I'm sorry to hear that you had to go through that. So on, so on and so forth. Uh, then the person uh, at the right here might respond to that by saying her own vulnerability. Like, I I had a case once where I or I did that. And and if if the first person also responds to that, detects the signal and does the same thing, well, uh, thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm, it, it, it does sound a lot like my situation. It, it sounds like this is actually normal. Then what is happening there? It's actually you're making, you're, you're closing, uh, you're, you're making the people become more close because you're sharing vulnerabilities. And as we will, as we will hear in a little bit, being vulnerable is nothing about not being strong. It's actually the uh, like, uh, being vulnerable is actually being strong because you will grow uh, and you will learn um, a non a, a, a team that is not safe about being vulnerable about things they've been going through is really really uh, fragile actually. Okay, um, of course there are there are limits to how to do this and so on and so forth. But this is the general terms. If this is done in a room, like the meeting that I just talked uh, talked to you about, then you will be creating an environment of safety. You will be creating an, uh, a culture of safety in that environment. And if you're doing it, doing it 
often enough, then people will follow your example. And that's one of the most strong points on this. Do, do it yourself. And then people will usually follow your example. Um, if you're a strong enough person to <laughs> follow through with it, because it's hard this, it's really hard to do this in social circumstances where, where you are against the grain. Um, but I think there was a Norwegian, um, Norwegian um, anesthesiologist working in the Middle East. Um, um, I, I, sorry, I can't remember his name, but uh, he he used to say something like like optimism, not not like not 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 like naive optimism, but finding optimism in really dire situations is one of the most important uh that, that, that is an active movement against um the evil and it's i mean this is i mean this crow says you should sit in a rubble with people this is sitting in the rubble with people and actually being able to creating an environment where you can actually um, talk with each other and when next time when this person makes a mistake they're not afraid of going to that other person saying, well, I made a mistake here. Can we talk about it? And and if you can do that, that in an entire team or in an entire culture, then you can learn from that. Then, you, then you're not afraid of saying, well, is, that is a mistake, I think. Can, can we do or, or Or I think that is a mistake. Can we... Can we can you do that in another way? Or could we do that, that in another way? This is part of the feedback thing. Uh, this is making a... This is making feedback possible. Um, and what makes it especially strong is if the person sending this vulnerability signal in the in the beginning is the leader of course they have to seem they have to be competent as well and that's just, it might be for some a hard balance to strike between vulnerability and competence but if you at a morning meeting can say well i wanted you i i, I want to go through a case where i made a mistake here can we can we go through it prospectively as i showed you in the beginning of this uh, part three lecture here and then, then you can then well okay he made a mistake let's try to see how how that goes and then, and then I mean if you go through this loop with this this person then, that's great then then, <laughs> then you are creating a better environment for learning and for your patience because you're you'll be learning from your mistakes, um, and if you can do this at a system level where we are not blaming but we are learning, from, from. Um, errors or patient events and i i hate this language because we don't have a good language for like making errors as we will come into later but yeah then we'll have a great system okay think about think, think of it as in another system then if you say well we don't make mistakes if you have a culture where we say we don't make mistakes here we have a zero mistake tolerance well then then the, the person on the right here will well, I guess I don't make mistakes then. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that is that is a um, that is impossible, right? Everybody knows that. Everybody being human knows that it's impossible in every setting. We can do our best, but we will always make mistakes. We are human, and the problem is then this person is not going to reply. They're not going to say anything because, well, we don't make mistakes. And last time I actually came to my boss with this thing, he bit my hand off. He said, well, you should have listened to me when I said that, or you should have, and, and not appreciating that, well, either the messaging might not have been as well, well, messaging might not, not have been, been as well delivered or um, the boss have blind spots on how, they, how he or she communicates or so on. I mean, so... The problem is, if this is handled, handled badly, then there won't be any feedback because there is not a a, a, um, a environment of safety has not been established. That means that this closeness is not going to work. Actually, we're growing, growing further apart. We are not learning. We're not closing our blind spots because we're not daring to come in, come with feedback and we have unhappy workers. This works in every environment, in your relationship, in your friendships, in your, um, in your, um, in your department and in your resource room. If you, if, if you are narcissistic and close-minded <laughs> as we all might be in certain points of the, during the night, uh, then, then, um, then you're not able to um, know, like create an environment where your nurses or your, um, um, other staff can come in and, and critique you or, or tell you like, well, this patient's blood pressure is now really low. Should, are you sure we should do this? 
right? So we need this in emergency medicine. We need this in, in life in general. Um, this creates a toxic work environment usually where people don't dare to say anything. Depending on the reprimand that has been done, when, when they do see failure, um, people will just be afraid to to do something they will not report it and or they will they will become really really defensive in their work which we do see in medicine we're becoming more and more defensive medicine in part because of this kind of culture of perfectionism okay um there is one case to be made by this and this, this is the um uh, or a, a great problem with this, a, like going into real details. If ever, anyone ever, ever wants to hear about this, they should, they should read the, the book uh, Consultane, uh, which sadly has not, to my knowledge, been translated to English, but it's a great read and it tells you about exactly how a political system can um, place a leader that is uh, immune to feedback and does not mm, want to realize any mistakes made. Um, and just just not listening to their frontline workers um, and how how bad things can be in such an environment. Um, that is what as that is a very very small part of what happened on the Leo Kaolinska. And again, I'm not receiving money for this, but I think in Denmark or in, in that internationally, I think there are a lot of a um, lot of great points that can be taken away from this. So I hope uh, that the authors. Uh, Anna Gustafsson and, and Lisa Röstlund uh, uh, will at some point do a podcast in English uh, so that we can all share this knowledge. Uh, I know things there there might be cases there are cases all over the world about this. Uh, this is very common, but this is just just a great and detailed case in our environment. Here was the book. Okay, so. If we do this right, we might establish this learn not blame culture of growth. Um, and I just wanted to go into some of the details about what happens sometimes when, when, when we go into a case where it's not a learn culture, but it's a blame culture. So what this, this is from Sydney Decker. And if you want to know anything about this, uh, like kind of failure culture and city decker is one of your guys to go to and this is a, he he has this um, he has these youtube clips where he he puts out for free his books and go through lectures about him so this is one of the um, one of the pages from from one of his lectures by richard cook uh, who originally made it and this is like like the hindsight bias in the picture right so the doctor is 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 in the situation and we as we talked well prospectively we have a lot of like scenarios and we have a lot of data we are trying to interpret and juggle and there might be a really complex environment we might be busy and so on and so there's a lot of ways of doing this case and interpreting this case and we might not have any, anyone to ask and then a mis mistake was made like this is after the fact that we we know that there was a mistake here he, we went into one of the mines here and the patient either died or something was delayed or like different uh, um, spectrum of mistake here but there some kind of accident happened okay then the the, the interpreter of this like the, the the external panel looks at this externally and will look through the retrospectoscope and they will only see like why didn't the patient sorry why didn't the doctor do this it was obvious to you should have you should have as, as you should have sicked when you we, we shouldn't have sicked when you should have sacked i mean but hindsight bias is so strong often and we need to go through the case prospectively by someone who knows how the environment is and description of the environment and so on and so forth um, the problem is right now in healthcare is that uh, this is from uh, the great quote from the Ian Crit podcast, podcast 249 uh, about mortality and morbidity and failure culture. So they say, we have this mindset that following the rules is what makes things safe. But when you actually look at it, a, uh, a busy department with time constraint and resource, resource constraint, um, you have to bend these rules to make things work. When things go right, um, we're not following the rules, but when things go wrong, it's very easy to look back to see that we didn't follow the rules and people just assume that because we were not following the rules, that is why things went wrong. But that is not necessarily the case. This is a huge problem that is explained quite well here, I think, that 
we are running faster and faster in medicine and we there are more and more things that, we, that should be measured like we're measuring this and that and we're spending less and less time on our patients we feel that anyway um and we feel that we're doing an insufficient job on them not communicating not not informing them and and, and not assessing them well always and sometimes let's just yeah doing poor work because we had to live up to some kind of metric um and Outside of that, we, we just some often often our departments, especially the emergency department, are is so um, is is so uh, busy or so chaotic that we have to. Well, you should we should always do this during, because of that is in the guidelines of our department to do this. But the guidelines is an algorithm that is not used for this situation, and we're trying to like just make things happen. And when we're trying to make things happen, then it happens often because we're quite good at managing these complex things. And when things happen, then it's that's great. But the problem is, and when we then when, when something inevitably go wrong goes wrong because even experts make mistakes, we all do. Then you can look back and in the hindsight bias and say, well, you didn't follow the rules. That is why that happened. And that is, I mean. <laughs> You have no words in that situation because it's so hard to begin to explain explain how 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 your reasoning was and what happened and 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 why they are why why they should get their ass down and and do the work themselves if they really want to know how this is like walk a mile in our shoes kind of thing we should not be arrogant about this we should always try to be better and try to learn but this is so frustrating when we're working in an environment that is totally, totally uh, chaotic and often pr and are prone to mistakes. Um, I cannot remember his name, sadly, but at our yearly conference a few weeks back in, in DASEM, D-A-S-E-M, we, we had this great Norwegian ethicist talking about um, blame uh, and responsibility and that, that we, as doctors, we are we do have the responsibility because that is our job and so on but we don't have the blame because if something goes wrong because the blame would be if we intentionally hurt someone by uh, injecting them with something that we actually wanted to kill them with like K uh, potassium or or if we came to work drunk um, um, and, and, and made the mistake and we actually wanted to hurt the patients and so on. That, these are maybe the right word for mis well, like, like for for errors but but in general the all the others all the other stuff is is is, is something that we has has part part responsibility in uh something a a, a thing that ben falk also has said in the book uh, at, at Verde uh, to be where you are uh, but but we but the the system is so complex that we don't have the blame the system has a lot of blame if not all of it but we have the responsibility with the patients Please um, go look up um, his lecture uh, on on the DASM uh, homepage if you are more interested in this kind of uh, debate. Okay, Simon Carly, uh, so, so, sorry, um, Martin Bromley has uh, talked about this model from um, Alberti, and I'm borrowing this from um, Human in the System Block, Human Diver, and the thing is like. Um, we this should be thought of as we we're we're going through speed limits here right like most industries might be here but we has have so much pressure on us we should not fail there's uh, there's time pressures and money pressures and and so on and more and more people are coming in we uh, in our emergency department and we actually like we infinitesimally we are making it the new norm to run 80 kilometers an hour, 80 miles per hour, which is illegal, or even 90 miles per hour. This is just another way of showing that, well, if we every day run 90 miles an hour, we are stressed uh, uh, every day and we have huge loads, a chaotic environment, and we are just making things happen, which cannot be done by guidelines, but we have to do it on the run. Then an accident happened, and then this thing like, well, you should have followed guidelines. Well, that's how people stop. That's how they stop being appreciated by the system because we are working our asses off, and nothing is actually 
um, being we are not being appreciated for our job and having something happen to a patient is horrible in this situation because we know we're, we might not be doing uh, everything we can in an environment that we're, that doesn't allow us to and so on but we're it, it, it takes bravery in these situations and and um, it's important to like say that this is actually a thing out in the literature and if you want you can look up these things it's a thing and start out by checking out martin brownlee a great 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 um um guy with an amazing um, like a, a larger than life story um, um so look him up okay i just wanted to show this as well um this is from simon carley's uh, making good decisions um, podcast and um and, and block on saying limbs. So in general, we 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 want we want we we often think of um, our errors as, be, as being uh, outcome errors. Like, oh, the patient had this outcome. He had a bleeding when I actually sent him home, and that was viewed out of as an error. But the thing is, um, <laughs> our our. Uh, what we actually want to be looking at is the um, is the uh, is the processing, not the outcome, um, because we cannot always do anything about the outcome. If we were gods and medicine worked every time and so on, then then we then we might be able to do something about the outcome always. But we usually can't. Even if we get, even if we make a, a good decision, there might be a bad outcome. Even if we do the CT before six hours, and we do the LP, uh, or the, the, the radiologist might sometimes have missed something on the uh, on the CT, or there might have been something might have gone wrong in the it's complex, right? So, um, they might go home and had a bleed anyway. So you made the good decision, and sometimes it's if <laughs> sometimes it's quite good, to, uh, easy to be confident that you made the good decision, but it's not always because not everything is as clear cut as the subarachnoid head rule uh, or subarachnoid algorithm for ct and lp um, was this a thunderclap headache uh, first of all was it something else that you just interpreted as a thunderclap headache that in retrospect oh well that was obvious that was a that was totally a dissection that you had there and and you just did a ct without contrast well that was a dissection and now hey they have a stroke i mean so, yeah, thunderclap headache is rare in dissection, but um, it does occur. And uh, so, so even though you have a good decision, that's that's where these prospective cases, like going through this case, I bet you most of the room in a psychological safe environment would would say, well, they would have done the same thing, and that is how we should be judged in those kind of the the decision making was good. It was valid and we might then go with the step further and say well next time we should also think about this but could we could we make an example of this should we do a ct angio every time we have a something that we might think a thunderclap headache well that is not obvious but we might if we don't do this in a systematic way we might next time we see a thunderclap headache and the next time and like for a long time we just will just order ct angios every time and this might even like this might um, damage patients as well, like injure patients over diagnosis. And you might even uh, go into creeping, like um, using CT angios for even some headaches that should never have, have had it because you, oh, that might be a thunderclap. And so, so you're that's called diagnostic creeping. And then you're suddenly you're ordering everything on everyone because you missed one case or you didn't miss it. You had good processing, but the system viewed it as a bad outcome. It's so important that we talk about these things and talk about with each other. That's why these cases that we're going through in a bit, little bit, it's so important that we know how to do this and the important importance of this. Okay, so again, let's just go through this. So you might make a good decision and a good outcome. Ray, that's great. <laughs> uh, and you might make a bad decision. Well, you might send that thunderclap headache home without anything um you th you did think it was a thunderclap headache you didn't think that it wasn't but you did think it was and then it's wrong to send them home right you should work them up unless you have a really really good reason not to um like them being 95 and not needing management anyway or so on, something like that but 
that a bad decision usually leads to a good outcome because most people, especially in the emergency department and, and in, in general, they, they are they might have symptoms that might indicate severity, but but like the majority of the times, if you do it ba like a Bayesian analysis of stuff, like they either the, the the things that we think are very harmful, they go in go into themselves, they're self limiting, or they might not have been anything in the first place. As Bernard Lowne says, most things that patients present with is like the rough and tumble of of life. That's like 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 psychosocial. Like if you have a small biological cause that is on the background of a huge psychosocial um, problem, then uh, and, and stressors and so on, then you will like like you will disproportionately have a massive headache when you probably sh in in other other days would not. And you might be catastrophizing and so on. So, all right. So, so, but so, 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 you can do a bad decision making, but usually have a good outcome. That's the majority of cases. But you will never, never find out if you only look at the ones that went wrong and the ones that went good. Um, okay. Um, then you have these, this, as I talked to you about, and that, that's a troublesome situation. That's where I think we should go through processes, not outcomes at least not just outcomes and we should do this like not only look at aerobatics we should also look at the um, um we should also look at um, um when the 95 percent when we are doing normal stuff right that's where we catch these things uh, as well okay and then you have the bad decision and the bad outcomes well these things happen we're not perfect okay and if there's a pattern that one person is doing the same thing again and again and harming patients, then totally that's something that is something that really should be picked up and then, then there should be some kind of system to assess that. But most of the time, it's more the environment that is making us make bad decisions in complex ways. Like, I'm not. We we should take responsibility for our for what we do, but we should also acknowledge that the environment is a huge part of it, right? And our education system. And I mean, this is why I'm trying to get this out so that everyone can know about these things. Um, and please comment if you are disagree. But I, I think this is hugely important. Okay. Um, another way of looking at this is Gary Klein's uh, model here if you from the book Seeing What Others Don't. I have not read this, but I've uh, heard him talk about this. And as I understand it, it's like this. So we, if we, we want to improve our performance, then we should reduce our errors. And that is like the Swiss cheese model. We should make the cheese, um, we, we should make the cheese parts with uh, as few holes as possible or get as much cheese in between the problems so that it will be caught. That we can do by doing smart checklists in certain situations that are not complex. We should do smart guidelines and so on and so forth, like in, in reduce inappropriate variability. Um, I think it was Dan Bohn Peterson, one of our, uh, 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 um, a great colleague of mine and a, um, a co-editor of mine and, and the, um, our former um, um, foreman in, in Dassem, um, he, he said like we we he said this great thing um, which I've <laughs> uh, which I'm I've tried to remember uh, that um, like I think it was like this I'm paraphrasing but trying to trying to um, if if we want to treat people um, the same we have to treat them differently kind of like that like, like saying implicitly that i mean as i understand it we should um people are different people are complex and we need to we cannot like put one size fits all treatments down on all of them we need to do a shared decision making we need to assess whether this is a serious case or not a serious case and so on and so forth right um so so this is important. And Gary Klein actually says the same thing. He talks about uh, when the hammer meets the anvil, um, the the smith has to like adjust every time the 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 sword that is being being um, try being being uh, 
smithened, I guess it's called. So so every every time so you you can just have the hammer hit every time, and you don't actually care how the hammer hits the sword. You you just have to know that. Uh, that, that that good work is being done, good decisions are being made, but you cannot micromanage each decision because because uh, guidelines are good at making certain stuff good, but it's only this mostly only the simple stuff, the complex stuff is really not that good at, and that's where we should be able to build expertise and empower people to to actually get expertise in the in the in the situations. Um, <laughs> Um, and that's that's the like the nutshell of all of what I'm talking about. How do how do we gain this expertise? How do we come up at the far end of the Dunning Kruger effect? Um, um, and I mean, if you want to know more about this, read Gary Klein's books and and follow this lecture <laughs> further on. Um, but this is this is hugely important that we not only try to re reduce errors, but we also try to be awesome at what we do and know when to see what we should see and know i mean and get the leverage to to do things in complex situations um try to try to the smack talk um the smack talk called uh, how to be a hero is a great example about how we should be encouraged to be brave in situations where there are no guidelines and we are we might get sued if we do something, but it's for the best, the patient's best. It's our intentions. Um, that should be weighed as well. Okay, everything I've been talking about here is summarized in a um, really good lecture by uh, uh, a great emergency physician um, teacher, Raul Patwari. Um, this Understanding Human Error um, lecture goes through these, like how can we Go through a more mortality and mobility con mobility conference, um, uh, and and actually learn from it. I don't think mortality and morbidity conferences are the only answer. I think, as I told you, every day we should do cases like this, just one case a day, prospectively going through. I think we will learn so much. And my experience from the different departments where we have done this, I I believe that is the case. Okay, what if we don't do all of these things? Well, the problem is we'll create a, a, a culture of fear, and this I didn't translate, sorry, but we'll get this, we, we, we might get this, what we call the risk proximity problem. That there's, uh, like, Jerome Hoffman usually says that Jerome Hoffman is this um, emergency physician professor and legend from the United States who, um, who talks about the fiduciary, that the reason why a doctor is a, um, we, we, we as a society, we, we have, as a society, made a pact with the doctor. Um, the doctor um, gets some privileges and gets education and and in, in return, the doctor promises always to keep the patient's interest above his own. Um, the thing is though, that in this current system of blame, and if we, <laughs> I'm not saying there is one system of blame, there are different spectrum of it, uh, and variances, but in a system of blame uh, uh, with these toxic vulnerability loops, you will be seeing doctors not daring to be brave because there's too much on the line. It's much faster just to order the CC scan. It's much faster just to just to do the default thing. Just give the antibiotic. Just do that. That's much faster. I mean, and I don't have to sit and talk with the patient, which I'm, you know, I, I, I love, uh, but, but, but there are other patients, so I, I, and I'm being measured in, on a metric made by some kind of an administrator um, <laughs> who, who, who isn't in my department, but he's doing like, uh, so, so, so there is, uh, and, 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 and I won't be sued if I miss anything because the, uh, the, the, the test, the great test is, is much better than the, the, the subjective judgment of a doctor expert. Um, so there's this morphed reality in, 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 in emergency, in, not emergency medicine only, but in medicine in general. Um, and we're not allowed to miss anything, that we're not allowed to be uncertain. Um, and this creates this risk proximity problem that the risk 
is actually on the doctor's side much more uh, like much more now because of this toxic environment if i um, and you can go to St. Lemnus blog and read about the risk, risk proximity problem as well in Risky Business uh, blog. But it's so there are so many uh, uh, advantages for the doctor uh, to just do the default thing and not be the doctor, not be brave, but just do the algorithmic thing. It's more time effective, it's lower risk of error and lower risk of second victim if I miss anything because I did the test. So I guess that's a test fault. Or the radiologist, depending on what I wrote in the in the um, in the um, order to the radiologists, um, it's it's measurable, and therefore it's the, it, that is the currency of the system uh, to to do the tests and to do it fast and so on. And the time that is measured outside my department, that is that is for some reason not measured at all. That is not weighed in any way. Um, and if the patient returns tomorrow with the same problem not being solved, well, I guess that's not my problem either because then I get double paid. I mean, not all the systems, but the, but in, but the nutshell of it is that the currency of the system is important. What are, in, what are, I, what are I, our incentives? Um, and I might be sleeping better. I, I might, I, if I have a hard time tolerating uncertainty, and we all do because we don't talk about this stuff often, often enough, and we don't create these psychological safety environments. Well, I mean, that's all right. Then we are, then then, then I have a problem sleeping now. Um, but but um, I might I might be better off if I just ordered the tests because then I don't have to send the patient home without the test. And then I, then I don't have to wonder about it all the time. And I don't have to wonder being sued and so on, but less so being sued, more so being judged by my peers. Okay. The problem is this is bad for the patients. This hype in the system that we can find everything and that every treatment is always good and so on. That's that leads to, I mean, usually it leads to premature closure. Not if you're not listening to the patient. Right. Um, and I've done a long, video on that as well um, they have not been listened to the patient will come back tomorrow and say well they didn't listen to my problem they will lose faith in the, in the system because they just ordered a test they didn't listen to the person the human being behind the symptoms um, and we might overdiagnose this patient and then when we overdiagnose one patient then we're underdiagnosing another as Iona Heath has addressed several times uh, because we're using money in one situation and we're underusing the other in the, in, in the other and under diagnosis is usually the patients with low resources and low socioeconomic resources because they're the ones who I mean who, who can't get to hospitals who, who might not be able to speak up who might not be able to complain so on so th this is what you might call the reverse Robin Hood effect that like making systems only capable of taking care of the more healthy patients will will actually um, disadvantage the ones that actually need it. Um, for more on more on that, look at look, look up the uh, the podcast on New Kaolinska, the uh, the consultant the book that I just talked about, or Morten Solomon in, in Denmark uh, has this book uh, has these new two new bo two books called Sopa uh, uh, and um, I think it's the other one um, is called. Something like that. Then there's this cascade of care, which was about the overdiagnosis that well, one, if I order a test on a low pretest probability case, then there is a high risk or some risk at least for a false positive. And that let's say the patient coming in with the chest pain and you have the you, you, you do the CT angio and you find a small minor minor pulmonary embolism and that pulmonary embolism will lead them to every time they, they, they come with a chest pain, they will get a new CT scan because their, their well score will be uh, high or they might not get a CT scan, but they will get a D dimer and that might be high half the times. And I mean, and sometimes they might get a bleed because there is a two the two to five percent chance of bleeding on a DOAC, um, maybe not the young, but at least the, uh, the older they get and so on. I mean, these are not minor things. Not looking into the evidence of uh, pulmonary embolism and the studies that were done in the 50s about these. I mean, so we are, yeah, here are some of the, 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 the references on this. 
And if you want to hear, hear it from the horse's mouth, then uh, Jerome Hoffman has this lecture called The Challenge of Physician Variability. And this, this B&J podcast um, from a paper he made uh, with a colleague uh, called Intolerance, Intolerance of Error and Culture, a Blame-Driven Medical Excess. Okay, uh, lastly here, the second, second victim and antifragility. So what is antifragility? Well, so all of this might create burnout for us. Burnout is a... Um, that is a specific narrative to call what we are facing burnout when we are in these complex systems and burnout is i i i'm not the only one saying this Liz crow peter brindley we should probably i, I i'm not fond of that word burnout because it, it it seems like deterministic it is a spectrum burnout and it's something that we should talk about and we need some kind of terminology but it is also a narrative there, there's also like why are we talking about burnout that like we're ending up in this hole where we if we are exposed to more and more stress um, from the work environment and some of the people speaking up against this is like Nassim Taleb and Jonathan Haidt and Liz Crow um, um, and I, at least that's my interpretation of it. Um, and I want to introduce you to this concept of antifragility instead. That's another narrative. So Nassim Taleb um, wrote this uh, long book and con called, uh, like he has a series called the Insurto series of books. I've never read any of them, but I have read um, people comment on, especially answer the antifragility concept. Um, George Kovach and Jonathan Haidt, among others. And as I understand the concept, it's like this. So if we have an exposure like the wind, then if something is fragile like, fragile like a candle, not a lot of wind needs to be, like not a lot of exposure needs to be put on this candle in order for it to blow out, burn out, so to, so to speak. <laughs> Um, if you have a more robust, robust um, thing like a, a torch, then there needs, there, there needs to be a much more wind. But after a certain amount of pressure, then the wind, then, then it will blow out. So these are our usual frame of mind that we just have to be stronger. Um, then we will, then we will, then we will manage. The reason why you burned out was because you weren't strong enough, or because the the exposure was hard, so hard. And I mean, that neglects the fact that a lot of exposure is actually good for us. I'm not saying that these chaotic environments are good for us and so on, but, but certain pieces of that is good for us, for growth, for learning. Um, and we might actually be able to handle it in a better way than just, than just being like dead in the road, burnout. We might be like the campfire or the forest fire where more and more wind just creates more and more uh, uh fire like it's 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 like it's um it's going uh, going to expand so and that is the definition of an anti fragile fragile anti fragile system uh, that is an, a system that grows with more and more pressure of course you should not over pressure it because then it might um, be a problem but a right amount of pressure and actually learning from that pressure and an example of this as i understand it is like the concept of compassionate care in in the emergency medicine emergency medicine cases have made a great block called uh episode 145 with the now um recently deceased um barbara T uh, barbara tatham um great uh, emergency physician uh, as i can tell um from from the podcast and she talked about this compassion to care uh which is so amazing and something that we all think about but she she puts it into words um in a great way and there's this book that goes along with it called compassionomics and in general it says this that we might grow from actually being exposed to these things and talking to each other and being compassionate with our patients um, because we might burn out if we don't talk to our patients, if we don't manage this stress in another way. And, and the management of this stress, we can talk about for a long time how to do this. I'm not, I don't have any pearls on this, but we should talk about this and how to do this. And one of the ways I think is by having groups where we talk about our mistakes, having vulnerability loops, talking about our emotional 
package with patients um uh, not, not talking with patients but but with our encounter with patients and going to doctor groups or nurses groups or team groups where we can where we from time to time can can load off so so to speak and actually f reflect on these things and actually grow about uh, from these things uh, they have something called short groups or Berlin groups that might do that um or we and we might might be like do these cases like this uh, where we create an environment of psychological safety where we can grow from like the feedback and, and like w where we can grow from things happening in the, the department and we should do that or we should do this now where it becomes a dynamic ecosystem and not a not a very um, fragile or maybe a bit ro robust system where where it's algorith algorithmically only um, guided. So antifragility in a nutshell is like um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, that is, but 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 is, there's more nuance to it than that. There's a certain extent, but in general, systems that grow. Um, and they've been talking about this. Uh, I was um, noted by a um, a psychology student, uh, Anna Buck who um, very kindly uh, talked to me about this um, study uh, from Christine Olson, pandemic-driven post-traumatic growth for organizations and individuals uh, in this COVID time. So it might be worth taking a look at. Okay, some of these concepts that I was talking about that I'm just brainstorming how we can do um, anti-fragility. Here are some of the um, some of the um, the people that have inspired me to talk about these things um, um, on this topic, and Jonathan Haidt, uh, Liz Crow, um, and and also um, uh, Caroline Elson in her book Also Human talks about these concepts, and we should in general have much more psychology in our leadership in, in medicine, uh, at least be guided because psychologists have experience about this. And they, again, they might spot some of our blind spots that we don't see. Um, and Peter Brindley and Liz Crow has made this, uh, made this, um, this uh, article called Psychological Burnout in Healthcare Professionals, where they're taking up the, the fact that burnout maybe isn't the, the best way of framing this. Okay, the last leadership thing is the clear direct principles and not um, do algorithms. And that's, this, this comes into like the complexity science and that's what we are going to go through now. So complexity. So, you, so this was not taught to me in school and I think it's so essential. Um, you have simple problems, you have complicated problems and you have complex problems. A simple problem is something that where you can follow a recipe and get somewhat the same result each time. Um, a complicated problem is more than one re one recipe where you can put more than one recipe together. Uh, like how the, and then you might um, putting all the recipes together, you might get a, a moon rocket and fly to the moon and do that the same time each time. Then I mean that's it's it's reliable, right? You can do the same thing at the same time, and you can make an algorithm and mechanic me mechanistic thing. And it's probably almost the same each time. These are simple and complicated problems. Then you have the complex problems, which are totally different. Complex problems are uh, with a lot of components, with a lot of moving parts. And if you do the one thing one time, then with one child, then, then doing the same thing with another child in a different environment, so many variables are different it might not give the same outcome because the, the, and, and that and what is characteristic of complex systems is this um, is thing that you need feedback. I mean, well, that didn't work on this child. We need to adjust them. And, and if, you're, if you're not adjusting, then you're creating a very, very uh, problematic system, right? If you keep telling your child to do one thing that they're not responding on um, and isn't probably the way to go with them, then you need to adjust that. And that's a, that's a thing about like a that's an that's an analogy uh, analogy about complex systems. I'll try to give more, but I think this is really essential because most of what we do is complex and cannot be put on algorithms. Okay, and here here are just some of the um, differences between complex systems and simple systems. 
And, but one of some of the most important things are these non-linear. It's it's not all, it's not obvious how relationships are in between cause and effect. They are usually dynamic. It changes over time, so you have to be <laughs> running while you're making your decisions, and you have to. It's really important with feedback because otherwise you know don't know when things change, and then then you're just acting on something that was uh, earlier on. Um, and I mean, you can look up these things yourself as well, but there are great links here to uh, YouTube has some great videos on complexity theory. These two are great. And there's a huge series on this, but these two videos will probably explain most of what you need to know. And here as well, and again, Jeffrey Braithwaite's uh, complexity um, explanation um, podcast there where he's changing how we think about healthcare improvements. There's also an entire book on the, like where some of these concepts are um, met uh, or, or, or told about crisis management in the acute care setting. Another another analogy is this, like uh, this is Gary Klein again, and uh, his book um, Street Lights and Shadows talks almost only about this complexity problem and how we as experts act in complex situations. Um, and how we become experts and how we with algorithms are doing what we might call erosion of expertise because we're not no we're not getting getting good at what we should get good at because algorithms are doing the good enough job um, and that might be good in some some aspects but on, in certain sectors such as healthcare I, I would argue it's not good enough Okay, so he says, algorithms guidelines are most useful in well-ordered situations when they can substitute for skill, not, not augment it. Um, and that meaning that you have to like you have to dumb down a problem. You can't have it undifferentiated patient and just use algorithm on them. You have to dumb down the problem, so to speak, to a, oh, this is anaphylaxis. Then you can use your algorithm on how to go through anaphylaxis. But that, I mean, even that problem might be, because they're shared decision making and, and, and you need to uh, what kind of patient is it and are they responding and so on. But it's it's a more dumbed down problem that is more suitable for a more is more well ordered, so to speak. But the undifferentiated patient coming in is complex because of like the biopsychosocial order of of uh, the, the like reason for presentation and so on. And so he says in complex situations in the shadows, because he talks about shadows and streetlights, um, where shadows is the complex and the streetlights are the well-ordered situation that you might see sometimes in the shadows. Um, algorithms and guidelines are less likely to substitute for expertise and may even stifle its development. And he says like skilled performers need latitude to depart from procedure procedures. Because if we if we if we have this situation where we are harmed by Every time uh, I, we are being uh, chastised, or we we uh, we live in a toxic culture where we don't dare to be brave, we don't be, dare to be um, we don't dare to be a hero and do the right thing for the patient, uh, because there's so much pressure on us already, and we are I mean every time we're just getting hammered when we when we make a small mistake, then we don't dare to. Um, so we need this latitude through psychological safety, through I mean and so on and so forth but but we need also to take the, take the responsibility seriously and we need the educa education to be responsible the responsibility aware okay so let's go through so i'll just um again here go through some of the examples of medical complex systems and why it applies to us so in a there's a complex system a complex system usually look like this this, this might be your department where, where they with well, a healthcare system like the 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 which might be the health department uh, of the, of your country or your region, and then then you have your hospitals, and you have your departments, and here you are in the in the bottom here, and the problem is like algorithms going out from here might not have any kind of idea what is happening down here. In fact, it's actually almost always true that they don't. Um, an example of some of these things. Um, would be when you when you when you see sometimes um, polit politicians go out to the departments and they don't don't have the they don't have the language or the expertise to see what they should see like seeing what others don't kind of way they don't know what they're not, not they're, what they don't know and they are seeing things through a patient's eyes not through an expert's eyes and that's why they're not noticing usually when they go down to the department and see well that looks fine I'm I'm really comfortable here. 
um, then they they might not be seeing all the problems that we're seeing, and 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 they shouldn't because they, they I mean things in our systems are becoming so complex that it's hard to like be over have over you or or everything. So it has to be in a different way, and that is what Jeffrey Braithwaite is, is trying, to, trying to explain in his in that in, in these blocks, and these are some of his take-home messages here: that systems can reject change when, when, when if they are in, if they are enforcing something from from uh, high up without consulting us and without having these feedback loops in this complex system, because we should think about a complex system like an ecosystem. If you that can or, or a or a like a body that can reject a kidney if 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 it, if it doesn't if it doesn't like harmonize with the system and we will just we will just if if, if someone puts push like if they from up high push a rock into this like ant farm here then we'll just move outside of it we'll just make changes like an, an example is the four hour rule target we will just I mean then we'll just um make um a department in the emergency department where we say well there is a four hour rule doesn't count or we will we will throw in or we might uh, have we might ma make other priorities like well if well if the four hour rule is so important then i then i'm i'm sad that i have to like throw this patient out or in even though i it would be much better for them just to wait 30 minutes more for their tests to come back and then we can i mean so we, we are we're just gamifying this if, if if things are being sent up from top down without our uh, approval or our without our very close feedback because because we are the experts in our place but we need we also need the people from up high but we they need to give us leverage to to do what we need to do and to rule some of the stuff ourselves um, and i think part of it is maybe we should have psychologists in our systems much more to guide uh, so that we can uh, so that we can learn about these like complex social structures as well um, there's this thing um, about measurement like we are being measured so much in the, our system, and 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 there's this thing called the McNamara fallacy that I just wanted to talk to you about. The McNamara fallacy is characterized by these features. So McNamara uh, was a, um, I think he was, um, he was one of the uh, ministers in um, during the Vietnam War in um, in the United States, and it, um, hugely complex. Um, war where they where, where, where they were trying to find out well are we winning or are we losing and uh, the way they tried to find out was well mcnamara he tried to measure everything like body counts and stuff like that and it's it, it wasn't really reflective of what actually was happening on the ground which which any like any um trooper would would tell them if they uh, if they asked um, and they had a had a psychological safety environment, but they, as, uh, as I understand, didn't have that. So um, McNamara came to his has later like has later said that uh, that was a mistake. But the, the the name sticks like the McNamara fallacy and the McNamara fallacy in medicine is is like some of the things that we see today is like the delusion that all of the complexity can yield itself to a numerical analysis and control. Like we can we think we can we think we can just measure everything and then there might be an output that we might be able to measure quality and like the four hour rule or we might be able to measure how many patients go through here every day and so so on i mean but the quality in the encounter like if i take five minutes more to explain something that that goes out without being measured and the problem is the currency of the system is suddenly only the things that can be measured like 100 percent of the currency of the system is being like what can be measured but all the unmeasurables the unmeasurables like talking like compassionate care like non-technical skills stuff like that it's not measured so we need to be able to see these things but that that is not the case right now over reliance on crude metrics such as hospital mortality rates 
The setting of arbitrary targets, many of most are of which do not improve patient care and mo some of which of course harm. Uh, might even take more time to do the, like there is this opportunity cost concept um, in economics that doing something costs something, right? So measuring something might take five more minutes from our patients. Um, and is that really well invested? Even though we can measure it now, or we might measure something, um, it's not really what we wanted to measure. Um, and, 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 and we are taking away something that is unmeasurable, but might be high quality for the patient. The pressure of audit and quality assurance programs on doctors to carry out treatment, which are not in the patient's best interest. This is the thing about guidelines. And I've talked about guidelines in the shortly about in, in part one and part two, and I will just shortly touch on it again. Uh, the neglect of unquantifiable uh, attributes such as communication, competence and continu continuity and compassion. Please be skeptical about this. This is my bias, but this is, and I talk about this a lot, but this is what I, I feel this is so important. Okay. Iona Heath says this, at the moment we waste effort, money and time collecting data and pursuing quality targets so that we have less time um, and we risk losing sight of the suffering human subject. And we risk destroying quality in our attempt to measure it great article called arm in arm with righteousness she's made so many good great articles please check them out and then there's this thing about the body being a complex system so we think like a complex system usually consists of small parts emerging to a complex system being more than its parts we are a lot of cells um, becoming a organ becoming a person um, and the brain in itself is a, is a hugely complex organ um, um, in, of, in and of itself. So, and every symptom we feel is uh, like every subjective symptom is, is like pain is brain um, is, is from the brain. So there is this problem in medicine where we, where we think that like it's an all or nothing response or we, we, we can, Oh, if we if we do this, if we give if we didn't give this patient uh, um, um, ASA, for instance, like blood thinners, uh, we, we we need to get this patient blood thinners because then then the clot will release itself and that's all right. We don't take into account the polypharmacy, the the, the, the why they're, they're they're really older, whether the um, this this complex system. Like we, we usually did the studies on a huge population. And when we go down to a much smaller population, like our individual patient, it, does that extrapolate really? And like, so these are, these are un, probably unsolvable problems, but it does make like this, there's this hype in medicine that is a problem because these problem has, problems has always been unsolvable. Like the, the, the body has always been complex, but, but, the 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 narrative is right now and has been for like since maybe the 60s or 70s uh through the um like the and and partly fueled by the pharmacology uh industry that well we can fix things by like with pills and there are really great examples of like miracle uh achievements in medicine i'm not saying that but what I am saying is that we could we cannot extrapolate those, those miracle achievements to everything, and we cannot do that with old guidelines either. Like there are certain guidelines that are great to do, like like for simple problems, and like the ATLS, it was great to do the ATLS for the average trauma person because they were didn't know about these things. But now we have moved on, and if we keep applying or uh, keep at, uh, insisting on not having any variability then we will lose our expertise and we will harm our patients and we will m totally miss what the essence of being a doctor is which is helping not not necessarily fixing so this is a complex the body is a complex system and i'll just touch on this thing about rationality because we we talked about this in, 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 in part one. 
either we argue from a rationalistic standpoint, well, this patient needs blood thinners because he has a, she, has she or he has a pulmonary embolism. Um, and well, a clot will open that up. Uh, oh, sorry, a blood thinner will open up that clot and will um, re, um, reharmonize the, um, the coagulation cascade. Well, um, the empirism will probably in this case say, well, there's only two studies in the treatment of pulmonary embolism and both of those were uh, dreadful. One was in the 60s, that was like a long time ago, would never have gone been approved today and had a really, really uh, low kind of, um, uh, <laughs> that, that we, wouldn't, we would not base anything on that today, but that is what we usually are basing things on. And then in the 90s, they did a new, another one, which was negative. So we don't know that it actually helps giving the patient blood thinners in an evidence-based systematic way. We do know it maybe in an unsystematic way, but there's harms doing that. Be, uh, like with the complex, the complexity of our this decision making makes this so hard, right? So we, we, we might think it helps because we think that patient was helped by that, but it might have been something else. And then there's the rationality thing again, right? So, I mean, well, but, but it makes sense. And the problem here is the body is complex, right? Well, it makes sense through the small, narrow view we have of our body. Um, that is our current paradigm. But if we don't do the systematic studies, we will never find out whether it actually works. There are certain things that are so rational or so like obviously good, like giving insulin to a diabetic that we should not do tests on it. It's called like the parachute argument. Um, but as Ioannidis and Paul Glashew and a lot of others in evidence-based medicine has made lots of studies on, um, it's kind of a problem that we don't have a better environment to test the rationality approaches and that the pharmacological system keeps um, having these incentives to um, to 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 make research that doesn't work. I've made a podcast on this in, in Danish um, on, in Akut Medicine. And, and I mean, please go check out uh, Anand Sensi's uh, EBM 2.0 or First 10 EM's uh, Evidence-Based Medicine is Still the Best uh, Kind of Medicine or um, Ken Milne's Masterclass in Evidence-Based Medicine. Um, but also, please, say, there's a lot of critique on, in the evidence-based medicine. Uh, again, all of this, like this, this, this filters down into guidelines. And I'm not against guidelines as a concept, but I'm against it when it becomes standards of care. And that is where we're heading when we have this t maybe toxic cul toxic culture of um, of. Uh, of, well, where we where we where we don't feel safe, we we don't dare to do the right thing, and then we just lean up against guidelines because that is practically doing the right thing in quotes. <laughs> and um, yeah, so so that that is the that is the problem that I see. On top of that, then we have gu guidelines actually being being um, being this. Um, <sighs> vessel for uh, distributing a lot of um, a lot of uh, pharmacology as well because conflicts of interests and and so on so i mean this entire system needs a reboot and that is what Anan Sensi has talked about and that is what ben goldegger has talked about uh, about we should stop doing all the research like for one or two years stop doing research just do um just do one thing and that is to get our act together, get the systems in order so that we can control or regulate everything so that we don't go after the novel things only, but we, we are as good as or better at reproducing, reproducing our findings. All right. Um, Simon Colley usually uh, recently also made a blog that even if we do all of these things, we might still disagree. And that is because of our pre-test assessment. We might have different approaches to rationality and we might have different approaches to empirism, making us disagree about the, um, the fact, not disagree about the facts, but because of our pre-test assessment, if, 
if we if you have a precess probability of five and another person has a precess probability of 50 then if the test being a new study um, if you make that like likelihood ratio of 10 then uh, then then the the, the post press probability for the two per different persons will be different even though they agree on the data that is a great and essential point i think by simon Crowley in his um is i just remember i can't remember the name of it but it's it's it came out here in i think it was april 2021 so yeah check that out and so what do we do with guidelines well i think we should as Iona Heath puts it, we should stop saying to doctors, telling doctors what they should do. We should make options based on the quality of data and based on um, based on what um, what the numbers needed to treat or whatever other measurement might be available or, or practical. But I don't think it's only the guidelines; it's our culture that needs to change about this encouraging us to do what we are uh, and, and be experts okay that was a long way around um before going to the cases but to this model i, I can now put like we have the hardware the mimics and the software um why communication and compassion and care work in in complexity i hope i might have explained some of that right now um because of it's complex always and medical reversal uh, and um, a lot of the research that we think is true like um, in, in neurology is, is the thrombolysis literature um, that is hugely controversial um, where you have the rationality argument saying well this works because it's a clot buster but we might not know everything right because it's rationality and then we when we go to the studies there's 13 rcts that were two of them recently have been uh, two of them have been positive but now they have been deep not debunked but they have been reanalyzed by by um jerome hoffman and i can't remember the other guy's name recently but making them all of the studies quite neutral and there might be like this makes us think about well why is that well are there collaterals is our, our paradigm of time is brain wrong which is probably is um are there so many financial interests and i mean if you look into the um, entire streptokinase versus also uh, place uh <laughs> absurdity and and uh, i mean just check out the em cases uh, journal jam on on in, on this like thrombolysis topic um and gian lenser's uh, quote that he got that she got from the also place that like doing a study on this might be a good thing for america but it's not a good thing for our profits like the the incentives of pharmacology uh, where they have taken up the, the tobacco company's playbook um like uh, deception is the rule um is, is, is uh, and, and making smokescreen to to like the add to the this disinformation epidemic infodemic this, these are hugely complex problems and these are the ones that we have to go forward try to solve and i i think in as an individual i think we can't solve much of these but we can talk about these things we can uh, speak up about it and we can try to not only be measured by measurements but actually try to and not only follow guidelines when they don't make sense and when they are not quality while, the, while they're not qualitatively made and not made for our department and at least we the least we can do is talk about this and make up our minds about it and make a better environment for us to be experts in okay i will need this um, um prasad um if you want to check out even more about this and check out those there were those names okay we've gone full circle now now we're back at the, the case level but this is like small instruction that i've been wanting to do for a long time um, um about how we learn how we think of cases why we argue how we do and then we can go into the cases um just so you are clear this is the approach I, I talked about in the part one and part two. Um, 
in real life you will use the, I, I use this like uh, a b c d e is the emergency first of all and then you do this where 80 percent of it is history and clinical examination and maybe you'll do this um but and then you in the back of your mind you will have these like is the is a lesion where is the lesion and what is the lesion and you will be thinking of bayesian thinking and you'll be thinking of the neurological model as well and the nervous system so but as i talked about in these last couple of hours when i give you the information then you I, i'm giving you the information i'm giving you the history i'm giving you some of the clinical examination you might be thinking of what you would do in the scenarios if i say stop what would you do name me three things that you want to do but i am giving you it so so in real life you have to be able to assess these things you have to be able to know what kind of questions you will ask and how you will ask these questions and that is that is actually the most important thing i think um, and you have to know in the back of your mind what you want to which diagnosis you want to rule out and that is what i'm trying to teach you here that is, that is what we're going to go through like what you should have in your head while this is going on while, you, while your encounter is going on making uh, and this will make you um this will make you perform better when with the patient we often talk about performance when in the recess but this will make you perform better if you know what kind of cases you might encounter this is that that the stuff that you can actually prepare before you're going into the patient's uh, room or before you encountering the patients All right so um as we talked about in the beginning with the system one um kind of thinking okay so so I'll, when we go through these cases, I'll only talk about where is the lesion, what is the lesion, and is there a lesion? And I want you to pin this into your mind um, because these are um, the things that I um, you have to think about during the during the encounter. And again, you might use this framework here, where you give some information, stop, ask, think. Um, Give, give a little bit more information, stop and, and write up your differentials and how did that change Bayesian, Bayesian wise and then come with a resolution. Um, I will say this, I will do a vulnerability loop. I make mistakes all the time here as a teacher and as a um, doctor myself and I'm also a student. So yeah, in all these roles, I make mistakes. I make mistakes. I do it often, um, but I try to learn from them. And, and I'm not perfect in that either. Sometimes you don't have the energy, but I try to. This is hard. Learning is hard. And learning these things is complex, All right? Um, but we can do it. And if you have someone to reflect with, if, we, if you can do these cases, I, I, I'm trying to show you how, how I would do these things, how, we, how I usually teach in, in, in the EMCC course. And then you might be able to do that as well. And with your, um, read some of the stuff that I've put up here. And before you know it, you might be able to go through it in, in the, uh, not just in neurology, this is my favorite topic to talk about. And that's why I'm talking about it, but you might be able to talk about it in a totally different setting, right? Um, every undifferentiated patient in, in, in the emergency medicine, should, we, we should go through it like this, I think. So just to remind you there are a couple of models that i that i have used and uh, there's this like in emergency medicine we, we like to think about if you, if you think about all the diagnoses that you can come up with for a certain condition and you would think of the time sensitive ones the not time sensitive ones the common ones and the uncommon ones and what we want to know is the like the not time sensitive ones the common ones then they might be important sometimes to rule out some of the more um some of the more uh, harder to rule out time sensitive ones the uh, example being bpv in the dc patients if you find a clear dix hole pipe then you usually can rule out a more severe thing and you have your cpress and you should never there are certain C, what a zebra is depends on the setting and is a is an or a or dissection a zebra well i don't think so but it is a um a, a central sinus venous thrombosis the zebra hmm, probably more so but um but we should know about a CPRS and if they have a good history, then we should think about those. But what we really always have to think about, those are the what we might call the hippos, the, the common and the time sensitive one, the dangerous ones. And then, the, then we have the not time sensitive ones and the uncommon ones. I've just used the unicorn here because it doesn't matter. 
they, they, they might as well be magical. I, they are not, they are, we should always be, all of these patients, we should be compassionate care and we should listen empathetically and so on. I try to help them. Numbers needed to treat equals one, as I usually say. But but um, we can't do much for these patients in the emergency department without, uh, besides communication and so on. So, and then you always have this spot with unknown unknowns, even though you might come up with all of these, always have a little spot for, I might be wrong. And that's where our bias mitigation techniques comes in. So if you, we, we, we uh, through the cases in the part one and part two, I've, I've made this landscape um, where, and we've put in our patients here, like in general, the the time critical the, the the common ones non time critical will always be the most common ones might have a pretest probability of 80. The CPRS will usually have a maybe a below one below one percent even below 0.01% risk, but the the common the common um, dangerous ones the time critical ones might be like maybe between usually between two and maybe 15% uh, before knowing anything about the patient. So it's always more more uh, common to have common things, but we should be look and 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 the, the thing is, the the sum of all these is a hundred if you follow Occam's razor. But the Hickam's dictum, if patients have more than one thing, then you cannot, uh, then they then they then it all doesn't add up to a hundred percent, and then you might have patients with COVID and ACS and pulmonary edema and so on. That are not necessarily related, but might be. And every time you ask a question, the, this landscape goes up and down, right? So, if this is an ACS kind of, uh, this is a patient with a chest pain, and the time critical conditions, then I mean, if you have anything showing on the ECG, then the time critical conditions go up, and the more common ones go down, right? Because if one goes up, the other must come down, right? And and the big question is how much workup do we need to be able to say, well, now we are satisfied, we have got, gathered enough information. And my as, answer to this is, well, we need to sit down with the patient, let them tell their story, do a decent assessment. But there is this like balance. There's um, there is no good answer, I think, to how much or how little. That is where our the art of medicine is. But for me, it's it's asking an open open question so that they can tell their story until they, and I listen actively. And 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 work from there. Okay, this is an important model that we always use. This is the, um, the diagnostic threshold or the cashier's threshold model. And the thing is just that you have a diagnostic threshold and you have a treatment threshold, as we talked about in the part one and part two. And if you are below the diagnostic threshold after your workup, um, after your initial questions and after your assessment, then do nothing. Because uh, doing nothing is better than diagnosing. Uh, there's greater harm in diagnosing at this point. Um, if you are below the diagnostic and the treatment threshold, then you should do a some kind of better tests um, where the, the test might be observation as well, because that might be the only good test you have. Um, but um, with this test, you need to either a good enough test to get over the tre treatment threshold or below the diagnostic threshold so you can send the patient home. And then above the treatment threshold, then you will have to well, treat. Um, and bear in mind, the treatment threshold and diagnostic threshold for a certain presentation is different. So for instance, chest pain, you will have a much lower diagnostic threshold for a serious condition that is easily easy to pick up by a good test. Um, um, aortic dissection being a, an, ex an example, um, where if you have someone with sudden chest pain, then there's a really low threshold to just do the uh, CT, um, especially if there's a bit of, uh, a few more uh, signs, right? So, um, but uh, doing a workup for, mm -hmm, let's say, um, let's say something like um, ACS, well, you do want to do that. You do have a low threshold for that as well, but not as low as you would for the order dissection because it's so much more dangerous. Um, 
and the same goes with the treatment threshold. So something that can like adjust the diagnostic thresholds and the treatment threshold is it depends on um, it depends on a lot of things, but some of them are like patient conditions, um, um, how 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 expensive the um, um, the test and the treatment is in 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 in, in terms of harm uh, to the patient or like radio, 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 radiologically uh, radiation um, like um, what are the side effects of treatment what are the side effects of a cascade of care how are the what are the risk of the cascade of care like doing a CT scan on uh, an elderly patient might um, might give you a false positive something and that will be followed up in in eternity and all of these things within might adjust the individual thresholds for an individual patient for the, the like for and, and whether we have a good treatment uh, right so there's a lot of these um, uh, if you want to know more about these please take out the smack um, the smack lecture uh, with um, um, with uh, Casey Casey Parker and then uh, this should be viewed with the the, the Fagan's nomogram and the Bayesian theory as we went through uh, earlier on but you have the precess probability and you have a test with a positive likelihood ratio and a negative likelihood ratio and um, this might be a uh, it's not quite a d-dimer because the d-dimer would be very low and a very good li low like uh, negative likelihood ratio for pulmonary embolism and a n not so good uh, positive likelihood ratio of course every test is different right there is the inter reliability whether that whether you did the test right and whether the test is reproducible um, and whether you actually did see what you needed to see the seeing what others don't thing from the talk just before but also um, but also is this test evidence evidence based in my setting in my patient and so on all of these things goes in and, and, the, and actually there, there should be a confidence interval here like like the likelihood ratio is two with brackets around and if the brackets are big then 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 it might not be as good so we also always we should know some of the like the important tests that we use and how good they actually are but in general all of this we can't know all of our tests this is not a mathematical thing it shouldn't be mathematical this Bayesian thinking or Fagans number at least I don't think we should use it like that we should use the concepts of it and yeah that uh, if you want to know more about that please check out my other videos on on, on this topic the probabilistic thinking and, and headache video for instance okay so please have these models in the back of your head always in emergency medicine um, that will make it much more easier to work in this environment um, and I will pull them out from time to time uh, not every one in every case but um, I've exemplified some of them in in in, in these cases uh, in part one and part two so far if you want to revisit some of those cases you can uh, I've, I've, I've timestamped these um, in the uh, in the last video and uh, in part one and part two video and um, um, you, can, you can check out those there